date. The time is 6 p.m. We're going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Can I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Hughes? Here. Councilmember Cordes? Here. Council uh, Member Larson? Here. Council Member Wall? Here. Council Member Hawkins? Here. Council Member Anderson, Vice Here. Mayor Anderson? Mayor Walter? Here. Madam Mayor, we have a quorum. Thank you. Let's begin with a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, please. now have call to the public. Call to the public for public comment within jurisdiction of the town council. Council rules limit public comment to three minutes. Individual council members may respond to criticism made by those commenting, may ask staff to review a matter raised, or may ask that a matter be placed on a future agenda. However, members of the council shall not discuss or take action on any matter during an open call to the public unless those matters are properly noticed for discussion and legal action. I do have two so far this evening. The first is Mr. Jerry Robert. Would you like to come up at this time or do you want to? Okay. Madam Mayor, uh, we have an agenda item on the Quinn building. He wants me to talk to him at that time? At that time, he wants to talk, yes. Okay. Thank you so much. I just couldn't hear you. And we also have Mr. James Sherwood. Mayor and Council, I. Uh, uh, my name is Jim Sherwood. I'd like to speak about the proposed ordinance 688-19. Maybe later get an opportunity to address the council also. I read an article about this in the paper and it left a lot of questions in my mind. Uh, the old section has been completely struck out and replaced given a restriction of only two vehicles, uh, parking ve for two vehicles per residence. And in the new section, and added, they have added a recreational vehicle storage, which will require a six foot solid wall with obscuring gates. I had my home constructed 42 years ago on the corner of Third and King Street, and where I've, I have lived, uh, it's 570 North King Street. During that, my occupancy there I've had managed horses, cows, goats, chickens, ducks, dogs, and cats. I've also raised uh, six of my eight children there. And at no time have I ever received any complaint about the animals, their smell, their noise, or their appearance. Nor I've not received any complaints on my children either. So I have a six foot chain link fence around the back portion of my lot and uh, about a three and a half around the front. Uh, I had aluminum slats in it at one time, but then I had to replace it because of the wind. We do have wind here in Florence from time to time. So uh, what I would like to do is, uh, I, I took a little time, I drove around Florence and if, uh, if it goes in like it is, and, and, it does, and if it does affect us that are already here, there's 81 family residents in the town of Florence, south of the river, that would be affected by this, uh, this new update. So my comment is that I respectfully ask the council to remove, delete, or reject entirely section C 
in Article 4 in the proposed ordinance, ordinance 668-19, or declare a defined grandfather clause. Thank you. Thank you so much for your input. We appreciate that. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak at this time? Okay, we are closing call to the public. Our first presentation is a presentation by the Florence Women's Club. Hello, Ms. Catherine, how are you today? Hello, Ms. Mayor Tara. Very good, thank you. And I wanna thank you and the rest of the council for inviting here to, uh, us here tonight. And we have a, over 122 years of history in this town, and so we're going to encapsulate it in about two minutes or so. And then I'll have some of, of, of our other members come up and give you some information about the projects that we do in our, within our community. Uh, and uh, uh, first, I'd like to just introduce the people who are here tonight from the Women's Club. Uh, we have um, Carolyn Gurney, who is our secretary and Coy Linda Wall, who is our, uh, she's also a chairman of a state committee, home life committee, and Maureen Downey, who works with our uh, web, our um, uh, Facebook and um, website, and um, then our first vice president, Terry Huber, and she's in charge of programs and speakers, so if some of you may be hearing from her to come and give um, a presentation about things or in, that we are doing as well. We'd like for people in the uh, in the community to know that we do have speakers that we would that we would enjoy going out to other um, organizations like the chamber or the Rotary Club. Uh, these organizations we've worked with, and just to let you know that um, we are an international organization, and uh, there are over 80,000 members internationally. Uh, in the state of Arizona, we have 38 clubs with over a thousand members just in the state of Arizona. Um, we're, we are also a corporation uh, and we are 501c3, which means that uh, most of the uh, money that we do in fundraising is turned right around and given back to our community. Specifically, we start with our own community, Florence, and our regional area around us. Um, that's where all of our funds usually go, and Carolyn will give you a little breakdown for that. Um, we we uh, also partner with a lot of uh, community service programs. We've got uh, outside of just our own community. We do the work in our community through these organizations, the March of Dimes, St. Jude's Research Hospital for Children, Hugh O'Brien Youth Leadership, Canine Companions for Independence, Heifer International, Operation Smile, Shot at Life, U.S. Fund for UNICEF. Um, we've also supported, we, we, within our organization, we have seven um, projects that are given to us by, by our national, and we are to pick one, but we have already, uh, in, since January, uh, supported the military with our GI-75, and we've raised almost $3,000 in donations for the veterans for that. And um, we've also celebrated, donated with Dr. Seuss books. Um, and so we will continue with those um, uh, uh, projects throughout this year. Um, we, our history was, we were chartered in 1897. Uh, with, you, know, you can read some of this in your packet, but we were, the, we were just the Village Improvement Society and we wanted to go, the ladies wanted to go around and make sure that the back lots and the streets and every empty lots were all clean. So they kept, they paid a lady 25 cents a month to keep the rake under her porch. Uh, so we, the history of Florence is very much embedded within our, our um, organization because we've done nothing but work for our community since 1897. We actually even built our own building, bought, brought our own, bought our own property and um, uh, partnered with, raised money through, one of them was a, a, a Liberty grant for $50. We started with that. Then we raised our own money through fund, fundraising and took out a loan with the Southern Arizona Bank in Tucson 
and started with a, um, uh, the inmates in the prisons and had a contract with them to um, construct our building and that was completed in 1929 and we've been there ever since. Um, so I would now like to ask uh, Carolyn to come up and give you an overview, a quick overview of our projects. Just to let you know, we do have, um, we will be leaving some applications here and with some other um, uh, information um, here at the front desk if anyone in the group is interested. And so now we'll have Carolyn Gurney. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Secretary of the Florence Women's Club, Carolyn Gurney, and I would like to introduce a couple more of our members that are here. Mary Battle is our second vice president, and she's here. Raise your hand, Mary. <laughs> and Leslie Rupp. Uh, if you saw our wonderful uh, float in the GI 75 parade, Leslie Rupp is the one that created it for us. And if you also had an opportunity to see or purchase one of the t-shirts from, from that uh, celebration, she also designed those. So she's a, a, a member of our club also. I just wanted to highlight some of the things that the Florence Women's Club uh, did, and I'll just um, highlight a few things we did last year. Uh, we always participate in the historic tour of Florence because we have the only Spanish revival architecture building in town and we are on the historic registry and it's um, it's a delight for us but it's also a lot of work because we have to earn money to we don't have an endowment or any other way other than ourselves to pay the electricity bill and the and the gas bill and all the things that need to be done for the building we, uh, every year we, we hold a bottled water drive. We just had one in March with the Florence uh, Fire Department and some water goes to the uh, police department too. And they use that to give out during the summer to uh, clients that in need. Our uh, fashion show, we also just finished that in March. That is a fundraiser that has expanded over the years. Uh, when we just had Florence High School in town, the Women's Club, provided a scholarship for a graduating senior uh, girl. When we added Post and Butte High School, we added another scholarship for those as well. And when a Florence uh, Unified School District um, got a Santan Foothills High School, we also now give three scholarships that we earn money for uh, every year to a graduating senior. In addition, we support uh, the Hugh O'Brien Youth Leadership uh, organization and that's held at ASU West every June and the Florence Unified School District chooses just one sophomore junior, uh, boy or girl to represent the town of Florence there and uh, we provide that scholarship as well. Um, we also help uh, this year we just finished with the Florence Public Library, Dr. Seuss Day. We partnered with them um, to uh, make puppets with all the children that were there. We had 20 children making puppets uh, there. And the next thing coming up is on April 30th. That's a bilingual story time that the uh, library is doing and will be there as well to make uh, sock puppets with all the children that they'll get to keep so they'll have somebody to read to or to listen to uh, when they get their free books that we also will provide. So um, last year with the United Way and the Rotary Club, we started reading by third grade as an initiative in town to help with literacy. Uh, and at that time last November, we uh, collected literacy bags, 50 of them, because there's 50 students at our Head Start here in Florence, and each one received a literacy bag that, that uh, included a children's book, a bookmark, coloring book, crayons, um, information for their parents, all from the Florence Women's Club. And, and we will also be doing that again um, at for the bilingual story time, and we also gave those out when we had Dr. Seuss Day. Also, I had the privilege of reading to Head Start this week, um, and it's always a joy to be with our littles, so that was wonderful for me. 
Um, uh, just a couple other things that I wanted to mention, and that is our community calendar. It's calendar campaign time now, and we charge $7 for our calendar. The, the people that, that um, put their ad in this calendar are the who's who of Florence businesses. They support us that way. We also put all of the, uh, the, um, the yearly information in this calendar. For example, all of your town council meetings are here. The Rotary Club meetings are here. The Women's Club meetings are here. And also, for only a dollar a listing, you get to put birthdays, anniversaries, or in member, memory of someone into our Women's Club calendar. Uh, we will, this calendar campaign will be having the 67th continuous calendar coming out. And if you, I'm sure you read our paper and you may notice where it says Florence birthdays and anniversaries. And if you ever wondered where they got that information, it's from the Florence Women's Club calendar. So if you want to have your name in the paper or anybody that you love in the paper, that's how you do it. So um, we, as Catherine said, we have some membership applications that I'm going to leave here with Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to call up another member? A little bit more information from you for our reporting areas um, so you know how hard we work around in our community we're given reporting areas domestic violence and awareness prevention advocates for children you see these in your in your packet um, going down through there just to let you know at our central district conference this year we were given first place awards. Um, we got first place for the special program in uh, domestic violence awareness and prevention. We got a first place um, for the district community service program, the arts. We got a first place for communications and public relations. We got a second place for District Community Service Program Education, and we got a special Certificate of Achievement awarded to us for Community Volunteer Service. So as a 501c3, as I mentioned, all of our, all of our proceeds, um, aside from our preservation or restoration and our operational expenses, goes right back out to our community in every way possible. So thank you very much for allowing us to be here today. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to give any of our board members who are here today or our membership chairman a call. Thank you very much. I thought my teacher voice would be loud enough. So these ladies put on a lot of fundraisers, a lot of events within our community. So I wanted to present you with a certificate of uh, ah, a certificate of appreciation for all that you do within the community. I wanted to encourage everybody to take an opportunity to become a member, as well as for Mark to put out in the paper anybody can be a member some things that I was surprised to learn is how far your boundaries expanded even though they are the greater Florence Women's Club they extend beyond into Santan Valley and throughout Pinal County so it's important to know that you can engage and interact so thank you <laughs> Thank you. 
If I could just quickly say, we had a delightful experience. We had Claire to visit us for our fashion show, Mayor Tare's daughter, and she was just, she's been so delightful. The last two years she's been at our fashion show. So, so thank you for having her come. Where do you want this? Uh, I know we love her too. Our next presentation and discussion approval disapproval will be accepting the comprehensive annual financial statement and expenditure limitation report. Ms. Rebecca Jimenez. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Town Council. Uh, you'll have to excuse my voice. I've got a little <clears throat> loop bug going on. But I did want to tell you that our um, annual comprehensive financial report and expenditure limitation is now done as for June 30th, 2018. The reports that are, are sent to various agencies for review that affects our ability to obtain grants, financing, and to monitor the town's financial position and the current and future financial strength for bonding and the ability to repay bonds. It's a document that investors may use when considering projects or developments within the municipal boundaries. The annual audit is incorporated into the comprehensive annual financial report. The expenditure limitation report determines that if the town has stayed within the um, adopted budget that the council has uh, approved, there are severe penalties if you do not um, adhere to the expenditure limitation, and I've included them in on the um, body of this text. The auditors are engaged to evaluate the financial information and verify that the accounting system, staff, and organization are following the guidelines for generally accepted accounting principles and government accounting standard boards. The auditors issue a letter of internal control to the mayor and town council and a compliance report. We have uh, Mr. Ben Hur from Fester and Chapman here tonight. Uh, if you would, he's going to present the annual audit to you and also a little bit later on the CFD audits. But I'm gonna turn it over to him right now so that he can answer any of your questions. Honorable Mayor and Town Council, thank you for having me to, uh, to present uh, uh, your um, comprehensive annual financial reports tonight. My name is Ben Hur. I'm with the Fester and Chapman, the CPA firm from Scottsdale. So first of all, this is our first years uh, performing the financial audit for the town of Florence. As you are aware, um, it is always kind of challenging to have a transitions from the one auditor to the other auditors. So I would like to express our uh, appreciations to the uh, town management and then the, especially for the finance department staff members for their um, support and the assistance for the, this audit process. Without their help, uh, it will be extremely difficult to complete this whole audit. In addition, to this year's audit is a little bit different in not just we performed the audit for the uh, whole town of Florence, the financial reports. We also uh, performed additional works for the uh, CFD, uh, which uh, management uh, requests to, uh, which is actually a legal uh, a component, a blended, compo blended component unit, which is actually part of the uh, town's main CAFRs, but management wants to have uh, uh, external auditors to review that one specifically so they can have uh, additional assurance on their financial statements. Uh, I believe we provided you three reports for the main uh, uh, town's financial uh, audit. The, the three reports we have is one called uh, uh, report to the honorable mayors and the town councils, and the second report is a report to uh, report of internal controls of compliance, and third report is comprehensive annual financial report. The first report is a uh, main purpose of that is is as part of the, our professional standards we require to communicate uh, what had happened during the audits uh, to uh, the, the council members. Uh, 
especially something like there are significant changes in accounting policies, accounting environments uh, to um, if there is uh, key information or estimate sensitive in, uh, information disclosed in, and then included as part of the uh, financial statements. And then third it is actually if there is any difficulties um, and then any other findings noted during the audit. So this year, during the 2018's audit, the, the main one changes in the accountings had happened uh, was uh, what we call the GASB 75 uh, uh, finance accounting and the financial reporting for uh, post-employment benefit other than pensions. As you recall, a couple of years ago, uh, there was GASB uh, 68 came out, and then uh, municipality needs to include pension-related liabilities to their financial statements. So this is kind of follow-up with that uh, standards to not just pension liabilities and then all the other uh, post-employment benefit liabilities to be included uh, towns financial reporting. So that's what we had and we implemented for this year's. So there was some additional liability and pension asset, pension related asset is included for this year's uh, financial statements. Uh, the second information is if there is any sensitive estimation disclosures uh, related to financial statements. Typically, we have um, included management's estimation on, on pension liabilities and then allowance for the doubtful accounts and then depreciation expense for the capital assets. Those informations are part of uh, financial uh, disclosures and included it with management estimations. As auditors, we actually review uh, the reasonableness of the, those estimations and then uh, proper statements of the, those the disclosures was considered as part of the audit process. In addition, so you actually can notice that from the financial statements, these days there is a pension related note disclosures are very intensive and then it is included in the financial statements. That is another key information um, you would be interesting to see from the financial statements. Second part of the, this presentation is uh, audit result. So as part of this audit, we have, if you look at the uh, page two of the comprehensive annual financial report, you would be able to see the auditors has a modified opinions. Basically, the uh, highest opinions you can get uh, from this type of the financial audit, which means uh, financial statements are uh, presented um, uh, in accordance with GAAP in all mature uh, level. Uh, the, however, we also noted a couple of the, uh, the findings uh, during our audit process that is also reported in detail in your second reports, uh, reports to report of internal controls and then compliance report. So there was four, uh, there's four findings we actually included in the report. Um, each one has a detailed um, narrative description of what there were and then that also include the management's view on the findings and then their corrective action plans for the findings. The last part of the, this presentation is a financial overview uh, from this audit. Basically, this report is kind of showing the, the government-wide uh, statements. So the, in summary, um, it basically is showing that the uh, financial status of the financial snapshot of the, the entity as a whole and what we call a full accrual basis of accountings. Um, it includes all the uh, long-term liabilities and the capital asset of the, uh, the um, town. Um, basically, this research just kind of tells that as of the June 30th, 2018, town of Florence had about $144 million of the net positions, uh, among which uh, majority of them is actually uh, not in a spendable format. It's basically their investment in infrastructures and then uh, capital assets. That is a consisted of about 60% of the uh, net positions. And then the, the other um, about uh, Twenty-five percent are restricted. Basically, there was external restrictions of how those uh, funds are to be spent. Then the remaining are uh, unrestricted net positions for um, the, the town can be spent in their uh, in their discretions. The second part of the financials overview are the government fund statements. Government. So these reports, these statements reports uh, activities in the major funds that are primarily supported by taxes and then grant monies. Uh, in overall, um, this uh, government of funds balances has increases about like $4 million from year to year that those increases are contributed by uh, increase in general funds and then the CFDs and the capital improvement funds. Even though there was some decrease in fund balances, highway and streets, uh, we 
um, it appears to be it's all planned uh, part of the budgeted uh, the 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 expenditures and so the last part of the, the financial overviews are uh, basically business types funds those the key uh, aspect of the, those funds are uh, the revenues are um, revenue received are sufficient enough to cover the expenditure expenses incurred for each uh, major funds so as you can see the water and sewer funds has uh, enough revenues to cover all the costs uh, incurred for those funds and then uh, sanitation funds is uh, almost break even so uh, basically that is actually uh, support the purpose of those funds the last slide included in here is for the pensions so these days, as you are aware, that when the new pension uh, standards came out a couple of years ago, um, the, the municipalities started picking up those the pension-related liabilities assets as part of their uh, financial reportings. And then for the, um, those informations are calculated by, uh, based on the actual reports provided to them by the third parties. Uh, for, he, for, the, for, for the town of Florence, you have um, two PSPRS plan, one for the police and the one for the fires, and then one ASRS plan. So um, this year's uh, ASRS, the pension liabilities is about decreased about like $800,000, and then that is a, uh, probably uh, mostly because of the market improvements last couple of years ago, um, and then police and fires, and then there was like a minimal uh, change in, in those pension liabilities. So this is concluding my presentations. If you have any questions, I do, but I'm just gonna see if anybody else has any questions. Okay, so I really liked the format that you used. It was very friendly. In the, um, in the report, it says what the town should do. I just had a question in regards to, do you help us? Whereas the first finding, it said the town should evaluate its year-end financial closings process and develop comprehensive policies and procedures. Do you make those suggestions, or do you work with our staff from this point to help develop those guidelines moving forward? Uh, most of the times, we are more likely to uh, support the, the your own policies and then procedures. When you actually come up with the policy and procedures need to be done for those type of I mean, for those kind of the instances, we will work with uh, the definitely towns to make sure we come up with uh, sound uh, solutions for each one of them. All right, perfect. That was my only question. I really appreciated it, and you put forth a lot of effort and time, so thank you. Thanks so much. All right, moving forward. We do, my computer glitched. We are adjourning to Community Facilities District Mayor, 1. We do need a motion to approve the audit. Oh. I'll make a motion to accept the Comprehensive Annual Financial Statement and Expenditure Limitation Report. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the audit. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, same side. Motion carries. We need a motion to adjourn to the CFD 1. Make a motion to adjourn to Merrill Ranch Community Facilities District Number One. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed. Same sign. Okay. We are turning this over at this time to staff presenter, Ms. Rebecca Jimenez, who is the interim district treasurer. Yes. This report is basically for both CFDs, but it was very comprehensive and it uh, outlined, the, the auditors did a very good job of outlining all the cash balances in each of the different district as they are broken down. Uh, CFDs are fairly complicated uh, and you have to keep on top of them. Uh, I think that um, as we're going along, hopefully I can impart some of this knowledge to the other staff. But um, it is very important that we get this because we needed to know the cash difference between our uh, tax levy versus the assessment collections because there's a lot of important things that have to be done for both of these areas. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Western Chapman. Good her. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Becky. So this is uh, this community facility district to financial reports was uh, like I mentioned earlier was recorded or reported as part of the town's main capers previously uh, because of the importance of the community facility district to have their own financial records to help them to keep track of all those kind of financial transactions and then to leave a good uh, uh, reporting uh, information um, to for themselves. So we actually performed be. Beside uh, the town's finance uh, statements, we actually performed a separate audit uh, for the uh, community facilities districts. This is actually the, the first time that the towns have, uh, the districts have performed their own audit. So we actually combined, compiled these reports uh, for uh, standalone entities uh, to be reported. And then this is actually, uh, I did not have separate presentation for it, but with the financial statements. So this is actually, that's what I was going to report it to. All right, Mr. Billingsley. I appreciate that, Ben. Um, as, as Ben just stated, uh, these CFDs have been in existence for nine years. We have two of them in the town of Florence. Uh, this is the first time that we've actually hired an auditing company to come in and audit those districts. A couple of reasons why. Um, number one, state law changed two years ago uh, and gave some very specific requirements in terms of usage of CFD monies balances and, and uh, how, how the various uh, deals, including bonds, must be managed uh, under state law. And uh, we have to come make sure that we're in compliance at the end of June this year. So the best way to approach that was to do a full uh, audit on those CFDs. Uh, so thank you very much to, for Ben for going through that process. Three of the four things noted uh, as part of the budget document uh, that uh, require some improvements. Three of those have to do with the CFDs and part of that is because they've never been audited and, and gone through in detail before. Uh, lastly, I wanna thank uh, Becky Galeen uh, and the finance staff for so quickly uh, once Ben uh, got into it and, and started looking at some of the things that, that we needed to research uh, further uh, Becky at that time really took the reins and worked exceptionally hard uh, to go back through all of the different books of the acceptances of resources and uh, the taxing information from year to year uh, with regard to the property taxes to make sure that we had correct balances uh, and, a, and a correct understanding of where we were. So thank you very much to Becky uh, for that effort. All right, thank you. Can I ask a clarifying question and at the same time possibly make a correction? So the CFDs started in 2006, so that would be about 13 years, correct? 13 years. Okay, that's okay. okay. I Sorry. just wanted to make sure it wasn't my misunderstanding. I was calculating in terms of when we started selling bonds and, and going through that process. So I saw Mark writing and wanted to make sure the correct thing made the paper. <laughs> All right, again, excellent report. Are there any questions from council? With that, we need a motion to accept the report. I'll make a motion to accept and approve the Community Facilities District Audit for CFD, dis CFD number one. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Make a motion to adjourn from Community Facilities District number one. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Need a motion to adjourn to Merrill Ranch Community Facility District number two. I make a motion that we adjourn to the Merrill Ranch Community Facility District number two. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. As I stated before, both of uh, the CFDs were audited in this single audit, so it would be just repetitive to go back through this again. Agreed. <laughs> and there's no questions or comments, correct? With that, we need a motion to approve and accept. Make a motion to accept and approve the CFD district, CFD audit for CFD district number two. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Make a motion to adjourn from Merrill Ranch CFD District Number Two. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries.
Thank you very much. Item 11 is our consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda will be handled by a single vote as part of the consent agenda, unless a council member or member of the public objects at the time the agenda item is called. Item A is proclamation declaring April 26, 2019 as Arbor Day. Item B is a motion to approve and ratify an engagement and representation agreement with Sims Mackin LTD and Kathy Bowman for legal representation of the town of Florence in legal matters in connection with the town of Florence versus ADEQ, number LC 2017-000466-001DT, town of Florence versus Florence Copper Incorporated, CV 2015-000325, town of Florence versus ADEQ, number one CA-CV 19-00122, Zero one two 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 Arizona Court of Appeals, including post-trial motions, appeals, and authorizations to enter into related common interest agreements, the appellate proceedings. Item C is authorization for the town attorney to execute a consent to withdraw on behalf of the town, consenting to the withdrawal of Christopher Kramer and Laura Curry, and the firm Jennings, Staus, and Salmon, PLC, as counsel of record for the town, in the matter of Town of Lawrence versus Florence Copper Incorporated at all number CV 2015-000-325. And item D is approval of the March 4th, March 11th, March 18th, March 25th, 2019 Town Council meeting minutes. And item E is to receive and file the following board and commission minutes. First is February 14th, 2019, the Arts and Culture Commission meeting minutes. Second is February 27th, 2019, Florence Youth Commission meeting minutes. Third is February 27th, 2019, the Historic District Advisory Commission meeting minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, that is your consent agenda. Is there any member of the public or council that would like any item removed at this time? With that, we need a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as read. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Item 12 is unfinished business. Ordinance number 667-19. This is discussion approval disapproval of an ordinance of the town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, amending the town of Florence code of ordinances, title 15 land usage, chapter 150 development code, Section 150.031, Definitions and Repealing and Replacing Part 3 Sign Regulations, Sections 150.092 to 150.130, Case PZ 18-33 Ordinance, Public Hearing and First Reading Held on February 19, 2019, Second Reading Held March 4, 2019, with a Work Session Held March 25, 2019, presented by Dana Burkhart. Thank you very much. Mayor, council members, staff has no new information to present on this, this proposed text amendment to your zoning code. Uh, the RCA included in your uh, agenda packets uh, provides a summary of the direction the council provided to staff at your uh, March 25th work session uh, with respect to am amendments that council was interested to consider um, as part of this uh, zoning ordinance update. Uh, amendment. Um, that said, uh, this ordinance has been processed in a manner to meet all of the minimum requirements and exceed the requirements of both the state and uh, your town codes. Uh, so the council is open to make a motion and take action on this amendment this evening. Um, that said, on January 17th of this year, the Planning and Zoning Commission forwarded a unanimous recommendation for the council to approve this uh, proposed text amendment. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I do have one that I've been communicating with staff and I'd want to share at this time with some council members as well. It has been brought forward in regards to item number four, where it states parking standards for single family and two family residential uses. Item C, specifically recre Oh, we are, I'm so sorry, I jumped ahead in my little notes. I'm sorry. I know, I'm on the wrong one, I apologize. I got ahead of myself in the game. John, did you have anything? Oh, yes. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Good. 
Yeah, I, uh, I have the same uh, concerns I've expressed before. Uh, first, uh, the flagpole. Uh, we have a 25-foot limitation on flagpoles, and I think if uh, Brian's not here tonight, we've already ordered, I guess we already have the flagpoles in that are, what, 30 foot? 35 foot, so we're already in violation of the code. Uh, I think this was brought up before about the word professional in the uh, uh, codes about having a professional appearance. That sort of bothers me because uh, uh, that's very vague. To be professional, a professional would have to do it. Uh, I also have concerns about uh, the inability to put a sign on a fence because if you uh, tour around town, you'll find signs on fences. Uh, you know, we're a small town. I think uh, we need to encourage our people to do business in a way that they see fit and a way that they can accommodate. Uh, you know, just minor things that this code doesn't allow if you read it word for word, uh, each weekend when we have signs out on the street about a, a uh, yard sale, uh, we're in violation of the code. Uh, if the kids want to put up a uh, uh, lemonade stand or something like that, they're in violation of the code. If the schools want to have a car wash and they're out waving signs, they're in violation of this code. I just, I just don't like this code. Uh, and I do want to thank the planning and zoning for all the effort that they put into this. But I think this is just uh, not the right code for Florence. Mr. Billingsley. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, we wouldn't be in violation of the code from a town's perspective because we're exempt from the code uh, as, as the town government and typically government flagpoles in particular, similar to the monuments that you've seen in other cities uh, around the country, the, the flagpole that is presented by the city or the state or the, the federal government is the highest pole uh, in town. But we, we would not be in non-compliance of the code by having a 35-foot pole because we're exempt. Uh, our, our signage is also exempt uh, from, from the sign code because we're providing things for the public good and for the whole community. Uh, also, uh, sign spinners or kids out on the, on the sidewalk for a car wash, uh, they are protected uh, in the state of Arizona. That would not be a violation of the code. Uh, sign spinners and folks out on the sidewalk physically holding active signs are exempt from the code. Councilmember Larson. The only thing I was pondering about that I, I remember, and correct me if I'm incorrect, um, was that we couldn't have off, what's the correct terminology? Signage is away from the property. I'm struggling today, you know this. So, um, uh, so that's, that was the only concern that I had was that, for example, there are um, certain businesses that are set back substantially from the direct traffic, and if we do not allow them to have signage on that frontage, most people would not know those businesses exist. Um, that's the only part that has come to me since that meeting that I would like to bring forward as a possible change, um, obviously pending other people's decisions as well. Michelle, could you help me with something? Yeah. The house on Bailey Street, Love Works, did they have a sign on their fence? I never had a chance to go by and check and I was meaning No, to. if they did, I haven't seen one, so if there was one there, it must have been something like a special something because the only sign they have is the historical marker, and then they have a sign that's affixed to the actual porch section of the building that says what it is. That's probably what I'm picturing, and I just... Oh, it might be, yeah. It hangs like right there on the... Right yes, off of, Kind of like I'm where thinking. I would say a gutter would be. Yeah. Um, I think Mayor? there's a couple signs on Butte. Fence signs. In front of the art, the paint and pour? Well, I'm familiar with the guy who does shoe repair. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah over off of Butte on the left-hand side. Yep. 
I just want to make sure that we're not making it too, you know, restrictive in some regards. So one possibility is, as we're going through this, Council Member Vice Mayor Anderson, if you have a specific item that we could bring forward um, as we're going through this, we can talk about an amendment in regards to allowing, you know, signs on fences. So do you have anything specific in this that you would want to? Well, I, I just mentioned that one on Butte. So that's one that I would talk about. Okay. I know there's some signs in yards on Butte about the windmill winery being down the road. And I was told that's probably in violation of this sign code. Do we have any business owners in the audience or any residents that would like to speak in regards to the sign code and how it may or may not impact them or any suggestions at this time? Uh, Mayor, as they're coming up, um, oh no, go ahead, come up, I'll talk fast. So is it possible that because, uh, you know, we do have a couple businesses that are not on a Main Street, they're not on Pinal Parkway, they're not on Main Street, they're not on a, a, a good flow of traffic, and especially, you know, because they're gonna come up and speak, the Windmill Winery is set back towards the back of town, we'll call it, and they're along a residential road, and then it turns to dirt, so if you didn't know for sure they were there, and you hadn't been there before, you would start to get down that road and think, I'm going the wrong way. I've, I've messed up because you're in residential. So I understand why their signs are there. And I, you know, we have the beautiful sign as you're coming in and you cross over the bridge. Is it possible to help alleviate some of this that we create another directional sign to tell people, you know, hey, these businesses are this way, these businesses are this way, and then it would help, as John said, you know, there's signs in people's yards or in easements and things that would help maybe alleviate their need because those signs aren't cheap and they disappear. And so then you have to keep replacing them that we as a town help our businesses by giving a nicer looking directional sign yeah. in maybe some spots that would catch people's eye and let them know, yeah, you need to turn here to get that way and you are going the right direction. Another one, Michelle, sorry, before they, I, I wanna bring up is Desert Rock Church. They have the daycare. And so there's gonna be other businesses that will, this will run into. So while well, I think that's a great idea and I, I love that we would be accepting the response, but I also fear that we would, people might see that as favoritism, of course, um, but also that you have to make sure that we're thinking about all the different spots where that might come up too. So make sure the policy sort of matches too. Okay. Madam Mayor, council members, if I can do my best to answer that question. Um, well, there was a couple of different questions on the floor. The first had to do with bandit signs. Um, keep in mind that it's, it's your code. So you can, you can uh, amend the code however you want and, and approve it. So if you feel uh, that it's important to allow bandit signs, the little ones that push in the ground uh, that go out there, they will still be illegal in the state right away and the right away will, the state will st come and get them. The challenge is with the, the Mesa and, and Gilbert uh, findings, it can't, we can't just say you can put up bandit signs for the windmill winery. We will not be able to tell anybody that wants to put up bandit signs uh, because it's essentially seen as free speech. I, I will tell you that many communities, uh, including a couple that I've worked with uh, in the past, have had tremendous problems with bandit signage, um, hundreds and thousands of them that have gone up during the weekends for properties that were on sale or home builders that were having open houses, et cetera. So bandit signage, um, I, I wouldn't recommend and, and uh, I would tell you at some point, uh, you would want to reconsider because you'll get more complaints than you'll get happy letters uh, for allowing uh, bandit signs. But secondarily to Ms. Cortez's request, we do have the ability under the code uh, to have what is called a kiosk sign program. And as a matter of fact, the town of Florence used to have uh, a kiosk sign program and those kiosks ended up rotting out. There were six of them in town. Uh, we actually took them down last year because two of them had fallen over uh, and four others were posing a safety risk. Uh, we had taken them down. Uh, if it were your direction, uh, we could come back at a future meeting and, and have a propo proposal with respect to uh, how a kiosk program might work uh, to, to direct traffic. The challenge that you will have is those, those 
signs will have a cost uh, to them. Uh, we will go out and hire a company that specializes in that. Uh, they will be in the town right away. They will own the signs, but there will be a cost per month uh, to be able to place on there, and it would be on a first-come, first-served basis, so there may not be enough availability for every business that would, that would want to advertise, but it has to be open to everyone, and you have to have a protocol uh, in terms of who's allowed and who's not so that you don't run into the favoritism issues. But we, we could certainly bring that back, and I'm very familiar with it. Larry's very familiar with it. Dana is very familiar with it. Uh, and uh, if, if you'd like that, we could, we could come back with that in a future meeting. Okay. Mr. Harold? Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the council. Um, let me, let me just address a couple of different things. One, um, we've been doing this now in Florence for, this is our 20th year being here. Uh, we have always fought uh, a battle of trying to get people to find us. It's, it's a constant issue that we faced. We withheld this last, uh, maybe three months ago, we finally did a few of the bandit signs up and down the street and so forth. I don't like bandit signs. I agree with uh, uh, what, um, uh, has, has been said that they will ultimately cause more problems than they're worth. But there needs to be some methodology for getting people into these business quarters. To me, one of the big issues that Main Street has faced forever is that nobody knows that it's there. Lots and lots of traffic up and down 79. I can't tell you how many people come to the windmill and say, gosh, we didn't know you were here and they don't know that Main Street is there either. So to get people, whether it's the kiosk uh, you know, concept, is a great idea that worked uh, for the time that it was up and so forth, uh, in a way of getting something that is, uh, John, I know the word professional, I, I'm not sure what that means either, but um, that uh, is a way to get a professional look onto these signs and get away from the bandits and the, maybe the homemade signs and that type of thing. But, I mean, there's the old saying that goes that uh, a business without a sign is a sign of no business. And I think that is very, very true. That, that held uh, for so many years and different things that I've been involved in. So I, I would encourage you to find some solution to try to get people into the business corridors that you want to promote and that you want to, uh, that, that you want to save. Um, it, it's just not going to happen by itself. And the bigger we get, uh, the more traffic that goes. I mean, the, the, I, I, I don't know what the word is, but the traffic was backed up from Country Thunder to Butte Avenue on Friday evening. Um, I, you know, there's lots and lots of people that are finding Florence, and there's going to be more as the years go by. Uh, opportunity zones are going to begin to be huge in, in what's happening in this town. The north-south freeway is going to happen. And uh, we need to be ready for that. And we need to have these ordinances. I, I'm, I think you've done a, a good job in getting a basic ordinance in place. I think it just needs some fine tuning to help those of us that are in business here. So that's my two cents. We appreciate your Thank two you. cents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, council members, how do we feel about directing Brent in regards to researching that kiosk? Oh, I, w I would like to see that in, you know, it doesn't even have to be that specific kiosk, but just research some ways to find that we could help our businesses advertise in a more professional manner that would not disturb the community. I like if it's more vague personally than looking at just the kiosk because I don't want us to be pigeonholed into this is what the kiosk is and what it must look like. I'd like us to explore other avenues for us to provide a signage for off street or off main roads. I don't know the right terminology. Road uh, businesses. Uh, we had this same discussion uh, two and a half years ago uh, at, at council. Uh, with respect to the old sign code and implementation of the old sign code and uh, off-site signage. And the decision was made at council at that time 
Uh, and I believe we paid about $35,000 uh, to construct the sign that is now out on the Main Street extension, specifically directing people to the downtown. And the direction that was given to me at that time was that we would not advertise for individual businesses, but we would try to direct people towards locations. And so uh, that, was, that was our first soiree into that, uh, that situation without violating the sign code and without, without creating a billboard I know that the business community was very happy and we got a lot of very positive comments uh, when that went up. Uh, that said, I don't, there's just simply not enough room to spend $35,000 on different roads, nor, nor would we want to block site triangles by having multiple of those in town. So the kiosk problem, uh, program is probably uh, more apt to uh, have a positive result without being obtrusive and, and be professionally done. Well, before, before we sh shoot down any other ideas, mm -hmm. I would like for you to explore some other ideas and not just pigeonhole us into the one. I would like for you to see what, uh, we don't want a big, huge sign like what you're talking about, but I'm sure there are other things that can be done that maybe we just haven't seen yet, or you know, maybe take a trip to some of these other towns that probably have the same problems and, you know, see what they've got, other states. I mean, this, we're not the only place that has this problem, but I don't want us to only look at one option. I want us to look at, it, it doesn't cost us $35,000 to look at options on our computers and, and have discussions that way. When we go to spend that money, we will have all made that decision and we'll all be comfortable with the choice that we're making, I hope. Um, if the council members come up with other examples from other communities, um, please let us know. Uh, I think uh, Larry's here tonight and he's very, uh, very aware of things going on. He's worked at about every community in Arizona, if I remember right. Uh, we, we will certainly do some research and come back to council regarding options that we found. Thank you. And Larry, in regards to our businesses, if you could reach out to them when you're talking with them to bring forward some of their ideas and solutions and ways that we can help and support. Ms. Kathy? Mayor, Vice Mayor and Council, I just wanted to mention a few years ago, uh, Mr. Christ had brought an idea to HDAC at the time to do a wall mural on the side of Butte, the um, large, I, I think it's a, well, it's, an, it's a vacant building. And we got into that discussion of you can't have off-premise signage pointing to the windmill. But a suggestion, in Gilbert, they have a similar type building at a major intersection. And they have a gorgeous mural of a replica of the town, and they highlight the businesses. And I've always thought that that might be something we could do without showing favoritism, but kind of focus on those hidden businesses. And that wall screams out for something. It would be wonderful. Where do you vision this wall? The, the one on Butte, where the, um, it's an empty building next to the Pinal Market? Yes. Right on, right? Because we had talked, we'd gone in, um, Mr. Chris put a lot of work into a mural, and we got all hung up on that off-premise signage. And it's a shame, because that's a great place for people to see all the interesting things you can do in Florence that aren't right at that corner. Well, and the artistic side of me wants to say that if you're having a mural or an art, it's different than a sign because you're portraying something we different. We tried that, that didn't work, but, but it's a thought, and I think it works, works well with in me. Gilbert. <laughs> and then, Thank you. You're welcome. Now, Mayor, the sign code, as it's written here, says that we couldn't have murals as signage either, so they would also have the offsite. And, and let's strike that out. Okay. You guys wanna strike that out, the murals? Oh. On table? I think we table. Well, how did we I manage to put a mural on the uh, vacant building wall on Main Street if they're not allowed? Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So we have, I mean, obviously, this is something that our community and our council and our staff is very passionate about. And, you know, they say that good things take time. And I'm very proud of the time that our staff and our community and our council has put into this. But I think that before we adopt something, it has to be something that we are all proud of and we can stand behind and 100% support it. It sounds like we're not quite there yet, but we're really close. 
So I do have a, a motion at this time to table this item. Um, yes, but can I, if I can. Yes, expand? absolutely. Yes. We're going to run in the same thing with B, with the with the parking. And that's okay. We'll get to that one okay. in a minute. Okay. So just go. Cool, cool. Okay. Yes. Um, I would like to make a motion of tabling ordinance six six seven dash nine one nine to a further date. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Mayor, can I have a clarification? Yes, ma'am. Is it a motion to a specific meeting or a motion to come back at a specific point in time? So when we table it, we can come back and we'll work with staff to get it on a future agenda soon. Do we have to set that date tonight? In the past, we've tabled it and then just had those discussions. Either we, we, we can table it until the recommendations that you asked are ready to be brought back and staff has looked at the options and is ready to present the options that were requested, or if we table it without a date, then I will bring it back to the very next meeting. Okay, table it with the um, understanding that you'll have an opportunity to look at the different options, okay. get that feedback and bring it forward. Okay, I had consensus on that. All right, and I do appreciate your hard work, everybody's hard work. and. We're doing great. We're making a lot of positive progress. So item B is ordinance number 668-19, discussion approval, disapproval of an ordinance of the town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, amending the town of Florence code of ordinances, title 15, land usage, chapter 150, development code, section 150.031, definitions, and part seven, parking, loading and unloading, sections 150.156 to 150.167, this is case PZ 18-34 ordinance, public hearing and first reading held February 19th, 2019. Second reading held March 4th, 2019. Work session held March 25th, 2019. Mr. Dana Burkhart. Thank you again, Mayor, Council Members. Again, there's no new information to present you uh, for this proposed text amendment. Uh, however, that your RCAs do outline the direction we receive, staff received from the council at the March 25th meeting, and I believe there was only really uh, one uh, change noted from that meeting regarding, uh, as you see in your report, regarding eliminating bituminous material uh, and seal coat. Uh, with that, uh, and similar to the uh, sign code, this ordinance amendment has received all the minimum and excessive uh, public notification advertisement. Uh, uh, council is open, uh, free to take action and make a motion, take action on this uh, amendment, proposed amendment this evening. On January 17th, the Planning and Zoning Commission forwarded a unanimous recommendation for the council's approval of the text amendment. So with that, we'd be happy to get involved or respond to any questions you might have. Okay. I accidentally started on this at the prior agenda item. But I've had many residents um, contact me in specific regards from the Florence Corps related to, on page five, it was section four parking standards for single family and two family residential uses. And this was item number C, where it talks about the recreational vehicle storage. I had specific questions regarding, you know, how would it be enforced? How would you know if I had a camper or a recreational vehicle? What if I, you know, go away for three to six months out of the year, but it's been there forever? I spoke with staff about some options in regards to potentially adding in a grandfather clause with some months, or even as to go as far as to say, how do you know if I had one before or didn't have one before? How would we really be able to enforce that in some of the discussions that I've had with staff recently as today? Um, I said, well, maybe moving forward on new builds because we have new builds in our community um, coming forward. And I just, I wanted us to have an opportunity to, to discuss it because these are recent conversations that just came about since our last meeting. And we also had the gentleman tonight who also shared some concerns regarding the two vehicles per residence and, and the wall as well. So that was a lot. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Mayor. I'll uh, address each of those. Uh, first of all, regarding recreational vehicle storage, that 
does sound like a great um, solution is to keep that existing language and add as of the adoption of this code for new control or as of the um, certificate of occupancy for new construction should it be after the date of this code or today's date basically or 30 days from now when it becomes effective so we can make that alteration or insertion in that code to establish a sunrise date for this code and specifically what it affects being new construction only or new home residence permit okay and then with regards to your second um, question or question I was looking in the code to see where that reference regarding two maximum of two um, vehicles per residence and I'm not I don't believe that is included in our code and it might be um, a misinterpretation of our minimum required parking spaces for single-family residences which is two parking spaces which is a very appropriate for a single off-street parking spaces which is very appropriate um, through the PAD process we can approve on-street parking as part of certain developments when they're urban and more or have a more urban feel or high density or uh, something in the uh, historic town center um, but in general when a new home is constructed uh, we do require that they show two off-street parking spaces uh, for that use so I madam think that mayor uh, it's on page nine thank um, you the additional uh, minimum required spaces would be two per single family residence that that doesn't mean that that's the maximum it's the minimum requirement okay thank you is that the way you understood it sir yeah come on up sir yes Mayor and Council, thank you for hearing me again. Uh, make one uh, clarification on what I said earlier. I do not have all those animals in my backyard any longer. <laughs> and I also don't have any children at home either. So <laughs> uh, my, one of my biggest concerns was the very first part of the, uh, the ordinance here. It says any proposal for the construction of new off-street parking facilities or the modification of existing off-street parking facilities within the town of within the town shall be subject to the following, which would include my concern about the uh, 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 number four and in, in C there, I believe, on them. <clears throat> what I have, I have a large lot. I've uh, well, I have uh, three boats in it. I have two utility trailers in it, I have a garden in it, and yet I can take my car or my pickup truck and go in there and hook up to any and all of that area. And so uh, I'm very proud of the fact is that I was able to acquire this property 42 years ago and it served me and my family well. However, the block wall, it would make a, a great uh, financial burden on myself and I, uh, you know, Florence gets a little warm and I don't enjoy thinking that I would have to live in a, you know, a box with no circulation either. So you, you take a look in, in, in all that stuff. I, uh, I keep my, my property clean. It's been uh, pictured in some of the things for the town in the past. And so it, it's, uh, I don't like a, uh, a tricy place but I do have and I just recently uh, my third boat is a pontoon boat so needless to say it sticks you can put a six foot chin fit or a, a block wall around it and you're gonna still see the boat that make any difference see? so that's my my biggest concern is is, is that so I, uh, I appreciate your your uh, attendance to this and and I thank you very much okay thank you very much all right, so it sounds also like some of your concerns are what 
Um, I've also been hearing, and Mr. Burkhart uh, suggested regarding maybe only on new developments moving forward, so that way that's something kind of uniform within that area of the community, and it's not negatively impacting people that have already been here and, you know, and imposing something that could be negative on them. Mr. Billingsley? Well, first off, I want to commend the gentleman uh, who uh, is us utilizing his democratic right uh, to come and speak before the council. I wish more folks did that. Secondarily, I want to say thank you very much for reading uh, that code. And I mean, it's not a lot of fun to read those things, and most people wouldn't understand it uh, if they read it anyway. So very impressive from somebody that sits in my seat to have a citizen take the time to get it out, read it, uh, come forward and comment. So uh, he should be held as an example of, of what being a citizen really is. So sir, we appreciate you. Uh, secondarily, uh, the, uh, the comment with, re with respect, and I think Council Member Wall uh, commented on it well, We've had a lot of comments in the last three and a half years about people parking on the street or there not being enough parking in front of, of houses. And so one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we included is that development should provide two, at least two spaces uh, for cars as, as a minimum uh, that are off the street with dwelling units, which of course, uh, those new houses in our subdivisions, that's required by uh, the CCNRs in those subdivisions, but we want to make sure that folks uh, provide opportunities on new builds in the town of Florence as well uh, for off-street parking, and, and that's the only thing that I wanted to clarify, but, but Ms. Wall did that for me. Uh, Mayor, to that point as well, the existing code requires two parking spaces as well as most Perfect. Codes in the nation require two parking spaces for a single family when it's in a suburban context. Excellent. My only change that I would like to see is that grandfather, or not the grandfather clause, I apologize, mm -hmm. is that new build clause going in in regards to the fences. For screening our recreational vehicles. Yes, sir. Correct. Council, is that okay with you? Well, so. If you have five recreational vehicles in your yard because one is old and not hasn't been used in 10 years, one is new and is being used. We're talking about new builds. We're not talking about grandfathering in. We're talking oh, but if, if you make it so that it only applies to new builds, then what I'm concerned about is yards starting to look like junkyards. And I, have, I don't want my neighbor's yard to look like they're storing cars and junk there because it does affect your property value. So my concern is, yes, if you have one, you know, if they're being used, that's one thing, but if they're just sitting there and they're, they're falling apart and stuff and, and you literally are just storing stuff, where, where's the balance at? Is that where code compliance would come into effect? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Correct. Mayor, Councilwoman Cordes, uh, the current town code does restrict the storage of junk automobiles or automobiles that aren't registered or licensed or inoperable. And that's the mechanism we use to identify vehicles that are inoperable and need to be removed because of a junk scenario. But does that uh, affect also boats and ATVs or other recreational um, items as well? It's, it's less clear. Uh, we use um, not only the city code, but the property maintenance code, which is on the agenda, later on the agenda, to do those things. I, I really appreciate Councilmember Court is bringing up this point because if you recall, we had three separate meetings last year where we spoke the staff, the council, as well as, as a work, work session was one of those three about property maintenance, about code enforcement, and about the looks in our community as, as well as property values. And we do a lot of code enforcement currently uh, with respect to RVs. Uh, Curtis spends a lot of time on that. Uh, from a staff perspective, two things. Number one, 
I'm not aware of another city that doesn't have this similar provision in the code. As a ma matter of fact, most cities, and, and Dana works for a lot of different entities, don't allow you to park RVs at your house. Uh, so Florence is already very liberal in that way, but absolutely, the, the more unscreened things that we have and we allow in our town, the more that that depresses uh, property values. And, and it depends on a case-by-case -case basis but sometimes um, we can't, from a code enforcement perspective, prevent things. Uh, primarily with RVs, uh, we have two main problems in Florence. One of those is people parking their RVs in the right of way because they don't have room on their lot to park their RVs, which, which we deal with a lot. And secondarily, people living uh, in RVs, which is very, very clear that that's prohibited uh, under the life safety codes. Uh, but the reason that we added this provision is because, uh, as I said, every other community either has a screening provision or doesn't allow it, uh, and number two, to try and assist in the look, look of the community and, um, and to, to help property values. A couple other ideas that I was having. Is there a way to have, say, a time frame and have a certification process? So if they are grandfather grandfathered in and they truly own it, they can bring their title down to XYZ location, get a certification to show that they had one at that property, and therefore allows them to not to have this grandfathered process? Or is there a limitation we could set on the number of ATVs? Because also there's other things that are, or not ATVs, there could be riding lawnmowers or other things that they're storing that we are we could allow on their property um, at any one given time. I mean, is there other ways that we could think about this policy so that that way then we can have sort of the best of both worlds, where we can be protecting the property values of their neighbors down in core um, while also um, allowing the people who are truly grandfathered in to have that opportunity? So I would, I would have, there's multiple questions there. So let me let me approach it three different ways. Number one, we decided as a group or council decided that we were not going to do proactive code enforcement. So we don't drive around town and see who's got RVs unless it's a life safety issue, et cetera. Typically, we do reactive code enforcement, which is when the neighbors complain uh, when, when folks turn people in uh, for, uh, for various issues, including weeds, et cetera, uh, unless we see it as a life safety issue, those are the top priorities, is, is the reactive side, the, the ones where we get complaints, or it's in the right of way, or there's a life safety issue. Um, secondarily, there really isn't anything in the code that says how many boats you can have, or how many ATVs, uh, et cetera, that, that, doesn't, that simply doesn't exist. Uh, the third thing, so it would have to be a life safety concern, uh, et cetera. The third thing is um, six of our council members live in Anthem. All this is prohibited uh, in Anthem due to the CCR. So it's really not an issue that has to do uh, with Anthem and the communities out there. It has to do with an issue in, in the town core. But, but Brent, what I, my point was <laughs> is that I care about everybody's property values, not just the property values sure. in Anthem. So I'm trying to look out for everyone's best interest here. And um, my recommendation with a number of vehicles and there are a number of things was that at that point, then it would say, well, you have three of these vehicles in your property. Now you have to have a screen. Now you have to have the fencing requirements. And that's where I was going with that, was that maybe we set a limitation on what that looks like. And at that limitation, now you have to screen. Um, the vehicles with a block wall or, you know, I don't know, I'm just saying there could be different policy perspectives to get us to a more unified front to where we can serve not just the property owners but their neighbors. That's, that's really difficult. It's, it's one of those things trying to legislate for every, every opportunity. Uh, to answer your question regarding the grandfathering piece, we have aerial photography that we can look at that is almost every year uh, and even even can be further back uh, if we were going to have a grandfathering clause very similar to the grandfathering that we have in the zoning ordinance it would be for a time period uh, I talked to the mayor about this earlier I said I, I recommended a six month time period if, if folks had an RV uh, and they had that park there uh, and could prove that it was parked there within the last six months or uh, a situation where they had that RV and perhaps they went RVing for three months in the summer, uh, they would be grandfathered uh, as long as that six months was there. And we would use aerial photography to prove that. Uh, but if somebody came in and said, look, I have an RV, here's my um, title, uh, if that RV had never been parked there, 
and we could prove that it had never been parked there, they wouldn't be grandfathered if, if we went down the grandfather clause side of things. Well, if what that if makes sense. Well, photography never caught it there. That, that would be, uh, that would, you know, it's one of those things, but we, we would have multiple years of photography we'd be able to go back and, and take a look at. And just for quick clarification, is the only aerial photography you're talking about, like that Google stuff that? There are several different types of aerial photography that are, that are done. Google's one of them. Uh, but we also, as you know, work with MAG to have aerial photography done of the city every two years. And we have brand new aerial photography we haven't even pulled in uh, from last year that was expanded to include Florence Garden. So we've got tools, we've got tools uh, in, our, in our toolbox. But really it comes down to uh, does council want to regulate uh, this storage in backyards or not in, in the town core? Mayor, Councilman Larson, uh, I would also make sure we're clear on, okay, is it the screening versus junk storage or, uh, can, uh, you know, acquiring a lot of things, vehicles in your backyard. Um, so that's held, that junk storage is definitely controlled under or regulated under a whole different set of property maintenance guidelines in the town code. Um, so storage and the screening of storage and whether or not people can do that is what this code would like to address. Um, just to give you a good example, uh, the town of Coolidge has a minimum requirement of 5,000 square feet per vehicle, trailer, boat, or whatever to be stored on that lot. So they have a way to control the number of vehicles stored. And then their only other requirement, one of their other re significant requirements is to make sure it's behind the front, proper, uh, the front property, uh, the setback line. So those are good mechanisms possibly to consider as a part of this new construction um, sunrise insertion that we're talking about, uh, as well as maybe a minimum area of lot, minimum lot area for each vehicle being stored. Those are great suggestions, thank you. So yeah, I, I like the idea of saying, you know, you've got to have so much square footage to be able, for every, unit that you know rv or whatever it's going to be that you're storing there and then that would theoretically eliminate the number it would bring that number down because unless you live on 10 acres you're not going to be able to have you know 10 rvs in your backyard and if you live on 10 acres you're probably not within the town limits anyways you're probably you know outside town limits and you bought 10 acres so that you could have uh, less guidelines that way one of the concerns I have, though, with the um, new construction is we do have existing neighborhoods right now, and I'm not, I don't know if they're HOA or not, um, Deputy Town Manager Garcia lives in one of them, that is going to have new houses added to it. So I, as a home buyer, see that I like this neighborhood and there hasn't been any available new construction. Now all of a sudden there is. Well, say five of those neighbors have RVs in their yard, I'm going to assume that I'm going to be able to have the RV as well. In Anthem, it's not allowed. So that's not even the conversation, but some of these areas where the new construction is going to happen within historic Florence, where we've got houses that have been there for 30 years or however long, and now we're gonna have new houses, how is that gonna work? Because the rule is only going to apply to the new 15 houses and not the majority of the community. So I, I've envisioned that creating some problems for those communities because it's going to be, well, my next door neighbor has one. Why am I being punished? Because I just purchased my house a year ago and they've lived there for 40 years. So I do have that issue with the only new construction that it applies to because I, I envision it's going to create a problem later down the road as Florence grows and these little pockets that were left are going to start to grow with houses and we're going to, you know, we can't really say, oh, just because your house is brand new, you can't have what your neighbor has. You made two fantastic points. Um, and we, we were just talking about these last week, Larry and I were. Uh, number one, the, the parity argument is going to be an issue, especially when we are encouraging infill. I mean, we've been working really hard for two years to try and get people interested to come in and do infill on existing lots. Uh, J. Carl Holmes is now here. They're going to be faced uh, potentially with, with this issue. 
Uh, it's excellent that you brought up the particular subdivision that Lisa lives in, uh, because at one time, uh, when it was built, sorry for using your name, but everybody knows who the deputy town manager is. It's, it's no secret. Uh, at one time, there were uh, CCNRs and there was an HOA in that subdivision. There are not anymore. There is no HOA. That's why those uh, open areas, streets, et cetera, aren't maintained. Uh, and so, yes, you, you bring up a good point about uh, the existing homes being in there and, and not having uh, the ability, uh, but future homes uh, do. Excellent point. Um, I thought that your suggestion with respect uh, to uh, minimum, minimum lot coverage or, or area is, is definitely something that we, sh we should consider. One of the main reasons why most cities prohibit RVs from being parked next to houses is twofold. Number one, uh, we have setbacks for a reason. So firefighters and policemen can get to your house and fight a fire or fight a fire through your property uh, or if there was an active shooter situation, get in there and access that property uh, from a public safety perspective. You take a big RV and you park it in there next to your house and up against your fence. Uh, the setbacks that we have in the codes for life safety reasons, they just went away. And now there's no way to access your property uh, or to, to help fight a fire or deal with an active shooter situation if you don't, if, if you, uh, don't have enough lot coverage. The second one is RVs are full of liquid gas uh, as well as uh, aren't built to typical building codes. That's why it's illegal to live in an RV on a, on a residential lot. But if, as you know, we've had two RV fires in, in, in the last year, uh, and both of them, gas tanks uh, exploded, most recently in the storage lot uh, at Caliente and Florence Gardens. You end up in a situation where not only is the separation between structures uh, ex exceedingly narrow, but if there's a fire and those gas tanks explode, the fire spreads throughout the subdivision uh, quite quickly and it's difficult to fight it. So uh, that's why in, in most cities they prohibit parking RVs next to houses. All of them um, are, are interesting questions, but we still come down to how should we best regulate it. I, I love the idea of certain size lots and, and, and lot coverage. Uh, with respect to where you can park an RV, uh, but really we're, we're down to screening and, and what that means in the historic district. I just wanted to clarify real quick is that we keep saying RVs as if that's the only thing that's included in this. Obviously there's boats and trailers that are called out, but a recreational vehicle could include like a date dirt bike or an ATV. So you might not have a big giant RV but you might have, you know, four dirt bikes or five dirt bikes. So it's things that we have to consider like that, that, you know, we think on these big scales, but sometimes these are smaller things that people might be having in their yards that will be affected as well. And I, I also want to make sure that, you know, we, we also have a lot of rule followers within our community as well, okay? Obviously you have your people who go against things. They're in every community in every area. I want to make sure, because part of being a homeowner is you have the opportunity to do with your home and your property what you want. As a homeowner, you know, there's that expectation that you take pride in your property and your belongings on your property. I would really, I, I just don't want to be in a position to say, you know, you, you can't park your trailer on the side of your house. And I know that in some areas we have that because of the HOA. However, I just want to make sure that we're not getting into that, you know, well, you have to build a wall if you want to store something behind it. I want to make sure that we're being fair about it as well. Council Member Hawkins? Well, from talking to staff, I, I, quite some time ago when they were talking about the solid six-foot wall, I asked, is this, uh, are you saying it has to be a block or brick or whatever? They said, no, it, it's a screening. So maybe we need to change the wording to screening because it could be, uh, my understanding was, talking to staff, that it could be a cyclone fence with the uh, slats running through it, or it could be a, a cedar wooden fence. In other words, it's, it's to block the view more than to be a solid block wall. And, uh, I, so I'm thinking maybe we need to 
change that wording to screen, a six-foot screen instead of solid wall. If if we stick with that. Can I raise a new issue? Yes, Vice Mayor Anderson, go ahead. Uh, new issue on page one. I brought this up earlier, uh, where we talk about the stabilization method to be approved by the town engineering. Uh, I don't doubt that the town engineer will come up with future uh, stabilization methods, and I think he, that's his job and that's his responsibility to do that. But I think he should bring those to the council for approval. Uh, I don't think we should be giving any member of staff a carte blanche approval to change policy, and I think this is a policy. So I, I would just uh, uh, delete that sentence out of that uh, paragraph. Page, page one of two, uh, subsection one. Revised section 2E and or a stabilization method approved by the town engineer saying let the town engineer bring any new methods to the council and we can approve it. Mr. Billingsley. Uh, Madam Mayor, we, we discussed this at the work session as well. Um, the town engineer is hired, uh, is licensed in the state of Arizona and, and has the bonding and the insurance necessary to make, uh, make decisions on behalf of the town. Uh, the t state of Arizona requires you to have three staff people, a town marshal, a town engineer, uh, and a clerk. And um, all the rest of us aren't required under state law, uh, but the, the state engineer not only had to have the education, the testing necessary to make those decisions, uh, but but does carry the the liability of the town and and is required to take that very seriously in, in this case there's several things that are looked at it it has to do with compliance with uh, PM 10 standards it has to do with compliance uh, with ADA but most importantly it has to do with making sure that the soils engineering uh, and testing that's done on the particular product uh, can meet the requirements uh, that are in the fire code regarding the ability to carry these very heavy vehicles that are that are loaded with water. Uh, so the, the intent here is to make sure that the person that's qualified to make those decisions is making those decisions uh, to protect uh, life safety and, and public welfare as, uh, as set under state law. I don't doubt that. My only point is uh, let him bring his recommendations to the council and we'll approve it. What? That's his job. That's what he's being paid for. He's an engineer. We hire him to take his advice on is it engineered properly or not. We don't, we can't second guess every. Well, that's what we're doing here tonight. We're talking about, you know, sign codes. We're talking about parking codes. And, you know, the town staff has made recommendations, and we're questioning those things. No, oh, you're right. Well, you're, it sounds to me like what you're, you're saying is you want uh, every time we have a new project, you want the engineer to come and explain to us oh, no, no, why he engineered it the, or, or why he accepted the engineering that the contractor is using. Absolutely not. Well, what, that's what it sounded like. No, well, what I'm saying is if they come up with a new stabilization method, a way of stabilizing a parking lot, for example, or a street, if they come up with something other than concrete or asphalt or, you know, crushed granite or whatever, whatever those methods would be, I think that the, the town needs to approve that method. Well, we can look at it as it comes along. I'm sure our engineer reads all the latest technology. Oh, I would expect him to, I, and I think that's, res that's his responsibility. Right. He's Well, I would think that he would bring the best option to us, I would hope. Is there a way to, and I'm going to ask I don't get ask what, feedback on this, if we put stabilization method approved by the town engineer, comma, 
as presented to council. I, if I'm understanding Vice Mayor Anderson correctly, he wants to be in the loop about it. Yes. Not necessarily saying what to do or what uh, not to do, no, just, just to understand what's. Yeah, I think this is a uh, uh, this is a policy issue, and I think that that's our responsibility as council is to prove policy. Can I ask what the what the point of that would be? Like what, I guess I would, uh, for somebody who's not an engineer, if that comes before me and they say, here's, I am an engineer and this is what I would approve, I would say, okay. I mean, I don't know what, I, I don't know what most people on council would have the expertise, expertise they would bring to that to be able to counteract, even if the, engin if the engineer says it's gonna be a, something that they, were, they would approve, then I don't see how we're gonna be able to add any at least personally, I don't feel like I would be able to add any value to what an engineer is telling me that is recommended. Well, if you look at the, the way the paragraph was originally, but the penetration treatment of a bituminous material and seal coat of bituminous binder and a mineral aggregate, when I looked that up, I found out that that is not approved by the EPA. Now, our town engineer was promoting that so your concern is more that he would use a product that not that he would but that there would be a chance that we could have a product put down that one is not within epa compliance or, or approved by them or that that maybe just we as a town would not want want it there want there for whatever reason we don't think it's environmentally safe or or whatever so that's why you're wanting it to come yeah. before us so that we could at least know what it is and have time to look at it before he puts it down so not necessarily just just so we were more informed of the product absolutely okay, okay. madam mayor if i may um i'm going to give a little philosophical statement from my own experience and that is that um from a legislative standpoint, uh, all the way from the national legislature to the state, uh, to the county and the towns, uh, we as, as members of the legislative body have to re rely on those people on our staff to make determinations all the time on many different subjects, not just whether or not a, a material being used on a roadway or, or a parking lot or whatever uh, is appropriate or not. And if we're going to get down into the weeds of looking at these kinds of determinations every time one of us disagrees with that determination, uh, we're going to be here all day, all night, uh, week after week, year after year. And, and with all due respect, I, I think this is an issue that um, is not really within our purview. As, as Council Member Larson mentioned, we're not experts in this area. We are not engineers. Um, and we have to have confidence that the people we hire uh, and that our management hires have the ability to make these determinations. Um, and, and this type of discussion really um, is not appropriate, in my opinion, from the dais. I agree. M Madam Mayor, I have, I have three things. Uh, number one, clearly, as a policy board, it's council's decision uh, what you recommend to place in these policies, and when you enact them, uh, we, we, will, uh, we will not ask questions, we will move forward and we will enforce them from a staff's perspective. Second of all, to clarify, I'm, I'm a little bit confused with what Councilman Anderson said because he just explained a penetration chip sale. There are millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars spent of government money, including congestion mitigation, air quality, which is EPA funds on chip seals every year. Uh, and there has been for the last 40 years. So in terms of a non-accepted technology, we spent $700,000 on, on chip seal material here in this town the last year. It very much is an accepted technology uh, and is utilized tens of millions by the county, specifically chip sealing dirt roads for EPA using EPA's money. So I just want to make it clear that t staff is not recommending nor implementing things that uh, are against EPA standards. I, I, I wanted to make that very clear. Uh, and, and lastly, it's a little bit of a slippery slope. I mean, we've had some of these conversations before. Uh, Pre-plats are approved by the Planning Commission. 
Uh, it was requested that copies of those pre-plats go and be made available in the council chambers for folks to review. Um, then it was site plan approvals and making sure that those site, site plan approvals were available for council review, which we did. The request was that all those would have to come to council. Uh, and it's also been questions regarding things that we have in our code that have been the ability for the town engineer or the zoning administrator to approve that those should come to council and we've had multiple conversations about these things and, and made our recommendation from our standpoint. Um, I feel strongly that our staff is technically proficient, uh, and that they're professionals and they always have the best interest of, of town, town residents and taxpayers in mind and I'm very proud of them and I think they do an excellent job and, and have proven that again and again and again and we hope that um, you continue to give us your trust and allow us uh, to do our jobs that we're trained to do and, and, and support us in, in that effort. Okay. All right, so we have two different conversations kind of going on tonight, um, one with the fences and the walls, one that uh, Vice Mayor Anderson had brought up. So I'm going to ask in regards to how we want a motion made. Well, uh, I will remove my request about the uh, stabilization method to be approved by a town engineer because I, I, if I'm reading the eyes correctly, I, I don't have support on that. So. I don't want to take up any more time. Well, on the wall thing, staff, I don't think they were uh, pulling my leg. They said that it, that it didn't mean, it didn't mean that it was a block wall, that it, it just a screen, uh, it could be screened in, so. And I believe that you're correct about that. The only. Oh, but if, but if it's a big deal to somebody, we can, you know, you could put screening instead of solid wall, but but I think I think we all understand what it is, and if there's a problem, it'll get worked out. I mean, I would like to everything's add that, right? not in stone. It's, once again, I agree with you in regards to the screen, and I think that's a great valid point that you brought up in your conversations with staff about the screen versus the wall. The other part that I would just like to ask staff to help us incorporate is the concerns that we've had from residents about if we've already had, you know, our RVs, you know, on our property. I don't think that it's fair to come along and say, well, you've had it there and it's not an eyesore, but now we want you to cover it up. No, my understanding also from staff was that that's not going to happen. It's only on new construction. Am I right? No, we, we discussed that tonight, uh, but somebody that was grandfathered and, and had an RV, we wouldn't enforce it on them, but if you were in an, the way it's written now, if you owned a home in town, did not have an RV and hadn't stored an RV before, but had purchased an RV to store it, you would have to screen it. The one recommendation that, that I would make, I just talked to Dana about it, it's probably best if we don't use the term screening because screaming could be seen as landscaping or trees or we need to stay out of that realm, so we would, we would recommend to have fence or wall, uh, if, if that makes sense, and I think that covers those variations that exist without getting into the screening component, if that makes sense. It does make sense. Well, I, did. I, must, I must have misunderstood something somewhere because uh, my understanding was it didn't matter. I didn't hear anything about having an RV previously or not. I mean, you know, some people don't own an RV for, you know, years and years, and then they decide, hey, I'm going to start going camping. They get to that point where they are able to because of their job or whatever. I don't think that they should have to go above and beyond any anybody else in in the uh, in this part of town. Uh, you know that. If their neighbors have RVs and and they're they're not screened in, I I don't think it's right for us to force uh, another house. Now I'm not talking about new construction. I'm talking about a house that's been there and and their neighbor decides to go buy an RV. Well, then he's got to build a fence on top of that. That is a substantial uh, investment. 
you know, you know this, I, again, and I love having these conversations with you because it, it gets these things going because we've had the eye opening from, you know, new construction versus old construction. And in that conversation, we learned, hey, well, in one community, you have a mix of infills where you have new and you have old. And the same as you just brought out a very valid point right now. Let's say, you know, Judy and her husband have had a camper for years and they have their home in historic Florence. And they know they do not need that fence because, you know, they've had it for years, they're grandfathered in. Well, then let's say, you know, myself and my husband are finally in a position, we buy a camper, well, now we have to put up a wall. I think that's imposing unfair um, standards across the board. I agree. And I think we have other uh, codes, as was pointed out by staff earlier, that cover if, if they have a bunch of junk, then that's already covered by, uh, under our code with or without a screen fence, so. Maybe, maybe mayor, you just strike C all together. That's what I was going to suggest. So if council is so moved, to would do. somebody entertain a motion? To do what? Approving it, striking section four, item C. So move. And a second. I yeah. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Great discussion tonight. Thank you, staff. Thank you, council. Thank you, residents, for your feedback. All right. Item number C is discussion approval, disapproval of rescinding the order uh, for demolition of the Quinn building and instructing the. Uh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was looking, the, striking the recreational vehicle storage. Did I say C or B? I think she said C. C. So we, and it's B, correct? Unfinished business item C is Oh, no, she struck no, 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 the parking no, no, no. section. Oh, section God, okay. I'm so confused. Sorry, I apologize. I had a panic for a minute. <laughs> it's. Always possible, Michelle. Glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> okay, item C. The mayor did not make a mistake this time. Discussion approval, disapproval of rescinding the order for demolition of the Quinn building and instructing the town manager to take action necessary to advertise the Quinn building for public auction in accordance with ARS 361480, disposal of property in redevelopment project area. Miss Lisa Garcia. Mayor and Council, as you recall, um, Tom and Lynn Smith did approach the Council at call to the public on April 4th, and they did make a plea to be able to go in and save the Quinn Building and restore the Quinn Building. Since that time, staff has met with the Smiths, and we have gone over the bid documents as well as the RCA explaining what needs to happen in order to put the item back out to bid. Staff must go forward and advertise for 30 days. We will have a sealed bid process and after which those bids will be brought back to council where well, council will pick the person who is most likely to proceed with the project. Not only the highest bidder, but the person who is most qualified and likely to proceed with the project. Also, staff did meet with the Smith family and Stephanie Rowe, the architect, to talk about the potential restoration of the project. And it was very exciting to see the Smith's ideas in how to move forward to be able to. To um, be able to see what their vision is on moving forward with the property. I would like to um, go forward with this. I know that the Smiths are excited, but right now the Florence Town Council has made a motion to demolish, so we'd have to go for forward and we would have to rescind that motion. Then we would be giving the town manager the authority to go for forward and advertise that. When I met with the Smiths, 
there was a section that was pointed out in the bid documents, and that is phase one of the bid documents. Phase one currently says a one time, or says that they have one year, the successful bidder has one year to stabilize and the availability for a one time 30 day extension. So that would give basically 13 months. Mr. Smith requested that the council allow something in, in the bid documents that states that as long as the, as long as the bidder is moving forward that the council would continue to work with them on the project, meaning if something was delayed, there's a SHPO process that has to be done and gone through, there's historical architects, there's the fixing of the glass sunroof, what do we call that, sky roof, skylight, that needs to be fixed, and so just to make sure that it's staying on track. Um, so that would be an option that we could add in if council so chooses. But at this time, as we've discussed with the Smiths, it would be on the market and anyone would have the right to bid and, and we would entertain all bids. So there's no guarantee of anything. But we're very grateful to the Smith family for wanting to put forth the effort in being able to um, accomplish this project for the town of Florence. It is an historic building that will be very happy not to see lost. I agree. And I would entertain any and all questions that the council have, or if you have questions for the Smith family on particulars, I'm sure that they would be happy to speak as well. I do have two things just prior to opening it up to questions. Uh, Mr. Jerry Rever, you wanted to speak to this item. Would you like to come up at this time? If there are any questions, you can do those first, and then I can comment. Okay, that works. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. I just didn't know if you had any first. Okay. Um, you know, I've spoke to you before about the, uh, the QM building, and I was part of the okay. first auction. I was putting money into it to save the QN building, so I do have a vested interest in it. Um, I have a house, the Mashea house. I've had it for 30 years. It's been stabilized twice with grants provided by the town of Florence through the Historic Preservation um, Office. Doing work like needs to be done to that house can't be done in one year stabilization yes but to finish it can't be done not not when you have limited resources not when you are doing the work yourself like i am it takes a while i um i don't want to sound nasty but the council's first oppression when they got the QN building was to tear it down. And that to me does not show a commitment to historic preservation. All I hear about is saving money and you cannot equate preservation with saving money because let's be realistic about it. You can't, you can't, uh, make any money on historic preservation. It has to be something inside, something that's going to support the community. So money doesn't mean anything really as far as preservation. It's the commitment from the town council. We lost three historic buildings because one of them burned. And now we have, well, <laughs> how long has the cat, the, uh, how long has the county been trying to figure out what to do with the empty lot when the county building is burned? Now we've got a second big lot on Main Street and what to do with it. Does the council have any ideas what to do? The QN building needs to be protected and preserved. You have somebody who's interested in doing it. I think you need to give him the chance to do it. Stabilization, yes, that has to be done. That should be the first thing. But from that point on, let him work as he can do it. 
There are building codes that have to be followed. We all understand that. But you know what? They can be done one at a time until it's finally done. As long as the building is secure. And look at it now. All you got to do is support the thing, make sure it's stable, and it's going to last till the work gets done. And you know, I'm sure you can, our council understands where you're coming from. And in response, our staff has done a great job of bringing forward the information. Unfortunately, that one building that burned down on Main Street, that's outside of our control right now because we don't own it. However, the prior time, and I'm glad that you brought, you know, we have this agenda item up because there's been a conversation that was out on the street where somebody said before you guys had wanted to tear it down and there was somebody else, um, the contractor, Schwann's architect, who wanted to um, restore the building. At that time, we went with a local resident who came in front of us and assured us publicly that it was going to be rebuilt and brought back to life and assured us. So our council at that time was posed with, do we go with the big business or do we go with the local resident who said that they had the time, they had the resources, they had the commitment. You know, what's in the past is in the past right now. We have this agenda item on because this item is important to our town. It is important to our history. I do want to take an opportunity to pre-thank um, the Smith family for coming forward. And they're here tonight, and I'm going to call them up in a few moments as well because they have invested in our downtown and revitalizing buildings. They have that commitment to the Pinal County Historical um, Museum, and they contribute very much to revitalizing that downtown historic aspect. So I do appreciate your comments. They were heard, and thank you. Mayor, may I make yes, a comment? Yes, you may. So phase one, we did authorize one year with a one time 30 days. But for phase two, it says the bidder must complete it within two years with a 60 day extension. And so, and once again, the council's always willing to continue to work just like we were working with Mr. Smallridge, as long as there's progress going forward. And for an applicant to want that stated somewhere, I do not have a problem with stating that because the council has been very, very respectful with the applicants working as long as they're working to continue the program. Absolutely, and thank you, Ms. Garcia, for pointing that out because, again, in the past, we have extended many opportunities and we want to bring that building to life. Demolishing it was the last thing we wanted to do, but that's unfortunately at that time what we were faced with. Council Member Hawkins. Yeah, and, uh, yes, I want to point out, Mr. Robert, you know, uh, you were talking about the uh, Coca Pelli, I guess. Is, well, no, you were talking about the county building. That, that building burned uh, and the Coca Pelli burned, and then uh, some years back, the general store burned. The town had no bearing on those. We didn't tear them down. They burned on their own or by some cause. But, you know, you keep coming to us and insinuating that we don't care about the historic downtown or, or the historic buildings, like we're just up and ready to raz every building we can raz. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. It's just that there's very few people like the Smiths that are willing to step up to the base and get it done. You said you had two grants or something on your house. Well, that's great. You, you got outside money to help you do yours. Uh, that's few and far between. Uh, most people don't, aren't, aren't, aren't that lucky. And, and so, you know, we've tried and tried and tried to get people to step up, but there isn't that many people out there that are willing to put the money that it takes to rehabilitate one of these historic buildings. So it's just a, I'm a pragmatist, you know, it, it's real. I mean, what, what life is real. If people aren't there with the money, the building keeps deteriorating. At some point, we have to make decisions 
for the public good, not just for safety, but for uh, blight, for everything. Uh, but believe me, uh, ever since I've been on the council, we have done nothing but try to help anybody that's willing to, to rehabilitate or to do anything with a historic building. There's just a few people that just, for some reason, don't believe it or, or, or don't grip it or something. I don't know. But that's all I have. Um, go ahead. No, Council Member Cortez, you are next. Okay. So I have one question and then I have a statement. Um, Ms. Garcia, with, um, are there going to be, there won't be any limitations if they decide to go with a different person to help them envision what they want to do with the building, right? They're, they're, whoever wins the bid will be free to use qualified whoever. They don't have to go with the person that originally looked at it or who the town has utilized. So, so they're not stuck into like a pre-signed pre contract or anything, right? No, they are not. The fact of the matter is, is that the building had already had architectural plans. So at times in order to go in and have those plans revised, it's a lesser cost yeah. in order to just go in. But if they chose to do someone else that had a historical background, then most definitely it would be the bidders that was selected's choice. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that the winner of the bid isn't confined to this one entity that they are free to to explore and of you course. know sometimes personalities don't click or whatever um but my statement is is that um i i sit as the liaison to the historical district and i attend their meetings and there's me staff and the H historical district committee members rarely is there anyone in the audience rarely and so even here, I'm, there are so many people still sitting here, and usually by now our, our room has emptied and it's you know us and Mark from the paper and staff. So the fact that there's so many people here is exciting to me, but we can't keep coming to council saying that we're not doing enough if you're not willing to come and sit with us and you're not willing like the gentleman to stand up and say, I read your code and these are the issues I have. If, if, if everybody is passionate about the historical buildings and the preservation of it, we need to act faster as a town, not just as a town council. We can't always put it on our taxpayers and town council to revive these buildings and to save them. Many of you have lived here 40 years longer. I haven't lived here that long, so I don't have the connections with the owners to these buildings. Many of you do. And many of you could start talking to these owners of these buildings and helping us as council get them to understand that not only is it hurting the town, but the building is losing its life and we need people to step up. And if, if they can't do that, then come to us so that we can help them find a way to, to either preserve the building or help them find a way to find someone that is willing to do it. So I just wanna say that I hear you and I understand and we are all very happy that we have somebody that in the final hour stepped forward, but we need to start acting before the final hour. And it has to be a town effort. It can't just be town council. We can't carry that weight on our shoulders alone. The historical district committee has meetings and a lot of times it's just us. So if, if you're passionate about it, then start coming to the meetings, start having input and start helping us all make a decision of how we can revive our historical district and our buildings, because we have a lot. These are, this is not the only one that's gonna come before us if you just take a walk down the street. We've got some that hopefully don't burn, but when I look at them, I can see the fire hazard. We have ones that have extensive mold in them. Nobody can go in there and, and open a business until they get that fixed, and then they've gotta stabilize it. So there, there are some investments that need to be made by everybody. And so I just hope everybody understands that it's not just town council, it, it's gonna take all of us to do it. No, you're, you're exactly right. But 
Thank you, Mr. Raver. I appreciate your feedback. I'm turning it over at this time to council. If you could just have I'd be talking more about this after a while. Thank you. No, we appreciate your feedback and, you know, come to, as council member Cordes had said, when we have these HDAC meetings, you know, that would be a great time to show up and as well as reaching out to council anytime and speaking with us, we're always available. Vice Mayor Anderson, you had something as well? Uh, yes, I'm uh, concerned about the stabilization and the timing of this, and I've heard uh, uh, Ms. Garcia's uh, proposal for option one. I guess I'd like to hear from the Smiths as to what they think about this option. While the Smiths come up, I'm going to go ahead and proceed with my presentation and just touch base on a few more items. Um, one, I did want to state that the company that did the bid was Low Mountain, and we gave it to Mr. Smallridge over Low Mountain Construction. And the second is, underneath the financial impact, town staff is requesting to work hand in hand on this project and to be able to invest in our staff hours in participating. We would like very much to handhold this project all the way through the completion. So we would like, we would propose that when Mr. Smith is meeting with, if they are the successful bidders, when he's meeting with his architect, that we would have our team there as well to make sure that we're all on the same page moving forward. And we would do that with any applicant that is the successful bidder. Um, and that is council's call on doing that, and that puts our staff time in with the financial costs. Honestly, if I could just speak freely on that, any of our buildings on Main Street that are historic and that are an opportunity to revitalize them as well as bring business in them, I personally fully support our staff working with them and helping them because I think that communication component between our staff and the people who own or want to revitalize the buildings, Yes, that's what's going to make it successful is everybody's on the same page throughout. All right, thank you. Okay, Mr. Smith and Mrs. Smith, thank you for coming up. Mr. Anderson, thank you for calling me up. He is correct that the time limits are a problem. However, what Lisa has stated tonight will work out in that fashion. The other fashion that we, or problem we have is, of course, we have to go in front of SHPO. Now, SHPO technically will be here on 24th. 24th. However, that doesn't affect what we're doing because until we get the bid, until we have the plans revised, we can't go in front of SHPO. But we'll get an idea what they're thinking when they come down here this time. So SHPO is the next big hoop to run through, and I think the rest of it will take care of itself. Thank you. Thank you. All right, is there any other questions or comments from council at this time? If not, can I please have a recommended motion to rescind the order for demolition of the Quinn building, instructing the town manager to take all action necessary to advertise the Quinn building for public auction in accordance with ARS 361480, disposal of property and redevelopment project area. I'll make a motion to rescind the order for demolition of the Coon building and instructing the town manager to take all action necessary to advertise the Coon building for public auction in accordance with ARS 36-1480, disposal of property and redevelopment project area. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, question. We talked about the property sale and what Lisa had, had proposed. Do we have to make a motion on that or? Nope. We, that was the recommended motion for action. Am I correct, Ms. Garcia? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Make sure. Thank you. All right. Item 13A under new business is resolution 1694. This is the discussion approval disapproval of a resolution of the town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, accepting streets within Vista Hermosa community. Arizona Boulevard from the town's west property line to the intersection of Iowa Avenue, Iowa Avenue from the Arizona Boulevard intersection to the north edge of the road into the town owned water facility for public access, circulation, roadway, and public utility purposes authorizing and 
execution by the town manager of supporting documents, Mr. Chris Salas. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. The, um, the recommended motion itself has most of all of the details in it by itself. Um, I guess one of the few things that I want to mention to make sure everyone understands is that when the initial request was made, this is an older road. It is not a new road that we would typically accept into um, our maintenance as development would occur. This is an old road not necessarily built to town standards. So we worked with Vista Hermosa to make sure it met some type of standard and at the same time, the town understood that we were accessing our, our water facility um, through that road. So it's a rather unusual uh, requirement, but at the same time, they did have to meet some type of standard, and the engineering department gave them several criteria, and the streets department did inspect it to make sure, uh, very similar technologies to what we use downtown here, essentially. Um, but it is not a new road. It, this is unique and maybe one of the only times I'll probably do this in my whole career. It was kind of unique in that way. But it did meet a standard and it was inspected. All right, thank you. Is there any questions from council regarding this item? Madam Mayor, I have one question. Yes. Um, as I look at the aerial view of the boundaries of this road, it appears that there are other residences further, I believe, to the north. Um, are those roads likely to be considered for inclusion or if not why not i think i have that mayor council councilwoman um, once again this was a request from from vista hermosa themselves we wanted to make sure uh, that the private roads stayed private uh, so any of those roads that are adjacent to residential homes including to the north stayed private uh, their primary concern, and they wanted them to stay private as well, their primary concern was making sure that the public maintained uh, that portion that starts off the hill, clear up to where the water tank was. One, one of the questions, Lisa and I met with them two years ago, I would say, with respect to this, was uh, they were worried about escalating uh, costs to maintain the road because of, of what was deemed Commercial, traf uh, commercial traffic or heavy truck traffic. And so we tried to isolate it to, to just those areas. The one thing that um, I, I would like to say is, uh, yes, we followed our process uh, to be here to accept the roads, but uh, Vista Hermosa, from the first time we met, we laid, laid out a, a road map for them to follow. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily a cheap road map because one of the requirements we had is that uh, they uh, actually go out and, and do uh, a chip seal on that roadway, a bituminous seal uh, on that roadway to, to make sure that the, the cracks were sealed up and, and the pavement was in good condition from, from a town's perspective so that we were accepting a road that was gonna last a number of years. And I wanna commend them uh, for the work that they put in and, and the fact that I think they had to have two elections uh, to get to this point uh, so that it, it, this is more of a partnership with, with the HOA. Thank you. All right, with that, we need a motion. I'll make a motion to adopt resolution number 1694-19 as read. Second. Motion and a second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Resolution number 1695-19, this is a discussion approval disapproval of a resolution of the town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, approving the purchase of certain lands belonging to David Martin and Jane Giampa, located at 525 East Rogel Street, Florence, Arizona, to be dedicated for exclusive use by the town public works department and other municipal projects and declaring an emergency. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. Um, this item as described is essentially for a water barn. This project has not been planned as of yet. So there could be some changes in the future, but this particular parcel, I'm sorry, I'm not speaking to the mic. Uh, this particular parcel is designated for the water barn. Um, for the members of council have toured our facility, uh, the public works building, we have several different, very old, um, small, small, small buildings in a connex that really don't allow us to store any water parts. Uh, one of our frustrations early on here, and I say uh, we as in Brent and I, is that we don't really have any space to store new parts. So oftentimes when we have to buy parts for a project, 
that's when we buy them is when basically we're ready to start. And a lot of times when a small water line breaks, we have a small amount of valves and we have a small amount of smaller piping, but it really creates a certain amount of latency that we'd rather not have, but you cannot leave pipe exposed to the sun. It deteriorates and becomes brittle. So um, this was a, a key project um, from the very beginning. There was a lot of trying to have coordination with the county, so that's taken a little bit of time as well. At one time, Brent wanted to have a facility that was shared with the county. Uh, again, a great idea, and it just didn't find fruition one reason or another. Um, these projects have a, a great amount of synergy because they are adjacent to the Public Works building and will allow essentially staff to be able to just essentially walk across the street. Um, Tim will be able to come to my office, I'll be able to come to his office. Uh, moving forward, eventually there will be a full site plan for this project that will come in front of all the regulatory boards. This has been a, a project that's been discussed uh, for, for many years uh, in the town of Florence and money was designated in the capital program for this year and uh, when you see the capital budget or the CIP uh, as part of our budget approval process uh, for the next year, you'll, you'll see that that project carries forward in, in terms of the, the utility yard and, and water barn. And something that is important for this as well is when we have a water line break, it will reduce the amount of time that our system is down for our residents, if I understand correctly, because we will not need to travel to Phoenix to pick these items up. We'll have these items within our barn. It will help with time. I definitely don't want to say that every time we have a water line break that we're driving to Phoenix. That's definitely not what I was trying to imply. It's just that sometimes we do not have all of the parts, and it does create a small amount of problems. Um, this will allow us to have asset management that we don't currently have, um, which is a responsible thing in this day and age. I, I don't really worry or be concerned about employee theft, but we should have asset management. We should be able to, to tag our items and have inventory. It only helps us, again, with uh, projecting costs, um, again, latency on, on breaks, just all the way around. It's a, it's a thing that is, is very much needed in our town. I agree. One of, and where that came from about Phoenix is conversations with Brent. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying we don't ever have to, but it's not every single time. No. And it's, it's not just running to Phoenix either. There's, there is economies of scale uh, in purchasing this type of equipment. If you buy 20 sticks of H, uh, HDPE pipe versus buying one stick of HDPE pipe, there's a significant discount. Uh, the same thing, if we're able to have 20, uh, order 20 hydrants and be able to store those 20 hydrants, it's a lot cheaper to buy two pallets of hydrants than to buy one hydrant. Uh, and uh, it just makes a lot of sense. It's something that all, all cities have, even smaller cities have the ability uh, to have a facility to, to house the equipment. One of the things that, that we're going to be struggling with here real soon is we're, we're gonna bring the water meter replacement project to council here. Uh, we plan at the next meeting. There are gonna be thousands of meters that are ordered. Right now, we don't have any place to put those pallets of thousands of meters. It would be, it would be nice to, to be able to take items like that that have a value and shouldn't be out in, in the elements and, and, and place them. Excellent. All right, with that, we need a motion. I'll make a motion to adopt resolution number 1695-19 as read. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item D is resolution 1693-19. This is the discussion approval disapproval of a resolution of the town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, declaring as a public record certain technical code documents filed with the town clerk and entitled 2012 International Building Codes. Madam Mayor. Did I skip something? Skip number C or letter C. I put a check mark next to it. I was going to take it out of order. No, I'm just kidding. All right, I'll go back. Resolution number 1696-19, discussion approval, disapproval of a resolution of the town of Florence, Pinal County, 
approving the purchase of certain lands belonging to Daryl Peterson, located at 575 East Ruggles Street, Florence, Arizona, to be dedicated for exclusive by the Town of Florence Public Works Department and other municipal projects declaring an emergency. That's because it's the same item typically that we just heard, so I put a check mark next to it. But Mr. Salas, would you like to add anything to this item? Um, yes, uh, just very briefly, again, that's the idea of that this is the lot that is just east of the lot we spoke of, so they are adjacent to one another. Again, the same kind of concept here, uh, synergy, and this lot is looked upon primarily for a, uh, a, a solid waste dump, if you would, a little area of, go ahead, Brent. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> A uh, recycling yard. So uh, essentially, we've we've had a lot of comments from council, including uh, during the budget process. I'm sorry to have a heart attack, but we have ambulances outside if you need some help, Mayor, uh, <laughs> with the solid waste yard. Um, we have a number of dumpsters that are located next to the IT facility at the park. We've received a number of comments over the years about what an eyesore uh, those dumpsters and those recycling bins are and, and the fact that folks often take mattresses, furniture, et cetera, uh, and, and dump those uh, at our park. Uh, one of the things that council challenged staff with when we were having the discussions uh, with respect uh, to working with a waste provider to allow for dumping uh, was that we needed to find a proper place to, to put those recycling bins and those trash receptacles because they serve uh, a positive public interest. Uh, so we would provide a, a facility to locate those dumpsters and those recycling bins that is not at the park, uh, but uh, can be easily accessed uh, and uh, can, can be better located uh, uh, from a visual perspective. Uh, one of the things that we didn't mention before, and I know I received a, a, a comment from uh, one of the council members about it, is once we purchase these properties and build these facilities, we're going to make sure that, that we put nice walls up and make this an attractive part of the neighborhood. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've already discussed trying to match uh, the decorative walls at the, uh, the police evidence facility right down the street so that there is uh, a like look uh, when going down the street. I like that a lot, and I'm glad that you said that um, at the meeting. The one question that I would have is right now, our residents are able to utilize those dumpsters whenever they want, 24 seven. When we put up the walls, would they still be able to access? Because I just want to make sure whoever is using it, they're not. Our, our intent, although it hasn't been site plan, hasn't been designed yet, but our intent is to have those dumpsters available 24 hours a day. Okay, uh, so they may not be inside the wall, they may be surrounded by screening walls, kind of like you would see in a dumpster in a commercial parcel. Excellent. Any other questions from council? Uh, one question. Is there any uh, consideration from the uh, neighbors, the noise? And uh, we will go through a site plan process uh, like other developers uh, would uh, with respect to the site uh, and whatever is required, uh, we, we will go through that process okay. as, as anybody else that would have bought that lot. Thank you. All right, with that we need a motion. Make a motion to adopt resolution number 1696-19 as read. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item D, resolution number 1693-19, discussion approval, disapproval of a resolution of the Town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, declaring as public record certain technical code documents filed with the town clerk and entitled 2012 International Building Code, 2012 International Existing Building Code, 2012 International Fire Code, 2012 International Fuel Gas Code, 2012 International Mechanical Code, 2012 International Plumbing Code, 2012 International Property Maintenance Code, 2012 International Residential Code, 2012 International Swimming Pool and Spa Code, 2012 International Energy Conservation Code, and 2011 National Electric Code and the 2009 
Accessible and Usable Buildings and Facilities Code. Ms. Lisa Garcia. Mayor and members of council, this has been a project that your entire staff has worked on, but especially the one-stop shop. And, and we came to you not long ago and had a work session on January 29, 2018 to go specifically over the 2012 codes. So at this time tonight, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go over the next three items. First item will be the resolution that adopts the codes by reference. The second item will be the adoption of the 2012 codes. This is the first reading only, and we'll be back on the 6th, as well as the Board of Appeal update. And then after we go through those items, I'm going to invite your fire marshal and your building official to come to the podium and answer any questions that staff may have. Those are your technical experts. And just to make sure that staff is recommending the technical codes have an effective date of July 1st, 2019. Typically, it'll be 30 days after you adopt an ordinance, but we want to have a specific moment in time that we're adopting them, so we've chosen the fiscal year to have them be effective. So resolution number 1693-19, it adopts the technical codes by reference. That means that one set will be in the clerk's office, as well as one set will be online. And all of modifications are adopted by reference as Exhibit A. Those modifications were recommended by your technical staff and how they would like to see the codes adopted and to be implemented in the town of Florence. Those will also be incorporated into the ordinance of the town of Florence by reference and they will actually be codified in the town code so that anyone who wants to know what um, codes that we have adopted, they'll go online, they'll look at the town code, technical code sections, they'll not only see the 2012 codes, but they will also see all of the amendments that are to those codes. And so um, the recommendation is for approval of the resolution tonight, and again, that only adopts them by reference. That means that if you saw in the council chambers tonight, when you guys went into the council, office there was on the shelf a set of codes that stood about this high and had about 12 different books those are the codes you're adopting by reference feel free to come in over the next 30 days peruse the codes get to know them more because your staff has been doing that for about two years and we'd love for you to come look at them the next item that we have would be the adoption of the technical codes again they're adopted by reference and they will be codified into the town code meaning when a builder looks at it, it'll say the 2012 uniform codes have been adopted and it'll list each section, and then it will go in and add all those amendments into the code. The adoption recommendation it will be back before you for the second reading and potentially adopted on May 6th with an effective date of July 1st, 2019, after which, because it has penalty clause, it will be advertised and it will be um, posted in three locations and it will be re remain posted for 30 days. Finally, we have ordinance number 67519. And in each one of your technical codes, there was a specific location to where they had a appeals section. And in each one of the appeals sections required specific technical advisors to serve on the board. That means if we were adopting 12 different codes, we would have 12 different board of appeals with 12 different individuals serving. Um, the town of Florence is a small community, and as such, like other small communities do, is you adopt them to have one appeal board, and that appeal board will be the technical advisory for all technical codes. So that's what we've done and that clarification is in each and every section within the code. Also, staff has gone in and recommended the following within the ordinance, and that would also be codified within the code. That is, decisions of, of the board must be rendered in writing. That's important. Um, and special meetings are held when necessary. The original code said there would be monthly meetings, but the only time the board really needs to meet is when there is appeal pending and they have been called to action, so we did change that to special. And the other item is requiring a three-fourths vote to overturn the code official's decision. 
That means of the five members, four members would have to vote to overturn the code official's decision. Right now, the current section says that it is a, um, it is just a majority. That means three of the five have to vote to overturn. And so the codes being adopted, I've just listed them here. They're also in all of your um, materials. In case you have any question, here are the other ones. Uh, again, they're in your materials. And at this time, I would like to invite your two officials up to speak to any questions that you may have that are of a technical nature. Let me ask you a question first. Yes, sir. Uh, you say these are going to be online? They, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions about the adoption process? No, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, code officials. Hi. How are you this council, evening? Council members. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. How are you tonight? Good, very Great, good. Thank you. Good. Any members of the council have questions regarding? I do. Council member Cortez. So on page three of 37, um, G section 109.7 reinspection fees, new subsection added to read as follows. Reinspection fees as determined by the building official may be assessed for each inspection or reinspection when such portion of work for which an inspection is called. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but you know what I'm talking about. Yes, ma'am. So my question is, um, if the item was in dispute or appealed, would they have to pay for that re would they have to pay for the reinspection? I guess I now that I've stated it, I'm like, well, I guess the appeal, if they win the appeal, then there would be no reinspection, correct? That's correct. What what the uh, the purpose of that code was, ma'am, was the if, if we have a we go out and do a, a typical inspection and they fail the first time not a big issue, we go out, we do a reinspection. What we have is some people will call in the inspection and not, re not repair the items of the first discrepancy. So we will go out multiple times and they're not doing anything to, to rectify the situation. So when we, when we get into the third time, fourth time, we have to do something in order to the, to move forward because it's a cost, it's timely for us to go out and do an inspection and, and whether the gates are locked, the person's not home for the third time, uh, they're not putting their plans out for us to do an inspection, they're, they're not actually fulfilling their portion, their, their portion of, of what they're required to do. And that's ex actually stated on the permit card that it has to be, we have to have access, they have to have the permit on site and the permit posted. Uh, so this is merely just, it's, it's not, uh, an everyday thing. It just happens once in a while where we people just do not want to comply with the issue of fixing the things that we're asking for. If there's a dispute or discrepancy that they, they don't agree with what it is, we're absolutely open to discuss it, uh, research a little further, and move forward. Uh, if we find that we're in error of it, we absolutely can waive it, not an issue. Do, and what is that fee? It's usually a $50 fee for a reinspection. And then my other one is um, down at the end of the page section, 111.4 uh, revocation amending by adding subsection. Um, a building official is authorized to in writing suspend or revoke a certificate of occupancy when a tenant space building or structure has been determined to be vacant or unoccupied for a period of 24 months. In that time frame of the 24 months, it was on the same page down at the bottom. What page was that again, ma'am? Uh, three. Three of 37. Oh, three of, okay. Yeah, so the end. So in that 24-month time frame, before that determination is made, um, and however we deem it vacant or abandoned, and I, get, I don't know what we do, we go padlock it or what we do, but before that happens, we contact those people, like is, there's a process, like oh, they get one letter, and then they get a second letter and a third letter, or it's just we sit for 24 months, and then on the first day of right after 24 months, we go and say, okay, you abandoned your building. Do we try to co 
communicate with the people before that point? Well, throughout the process, the, the two-year process that you referred to, uh, I believe it states in there that two of the three items have to exist for it to be considered abandoned. Is that, did you see that portion in there, ma'am? Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm what that's basically is the- Clarity. <laughs> uh, what we're looking at is if the building is sat empty um, and basically due to a vacancy, so a tenant has moved out and they've not re, a uh, new tenant has not moved back in, that's not where the concern is. The concern is the empty buildings that have set and dilapidated so that when we start having weeds, we start having the building is falling down, certain issues, they're just not being addressed. So that looks, that's the part based on previous conversations we've had about how to address the empty buildings and vacant buildings. We had to put a process in place that will allow us that if the building has sat over two years, uh, and I want to say abandoned, meaning that nobody has, uh, has done any maintenance to the building, there's trash buildup, those items, and that's why it's two of the three listed, no utilities have been turned on, then when the, the owner decides to go ahead and reoccupy the building to reestablish a building, that's when we have to go and address that, hey, at this point in time, we need to bring it up to the current code. Because it sat empty for so long, it, it has not met what the building was designed for, it has not been utilized for what it was designed for, or what the C previous COO was issued for it. So there's just a point that we have uh, numerous buildings that have not been addressed. Uh, we don't have a CFO, a, uh, a basically a, a classification of the building because it's been empty for, for 10 years. So we don't really have, the, have a grandfather right to go and say you're still grandfather's grocery store even though it's been vacant for 10 years. It really doesn't meet the requirements of the, of the new code. So therefore we, going back to the 24 months, that was just kind of a, a timeline that was acceptable that we don't want to do it too soon where it's unfair to a consumer or to the, to the owner that just because somebody left, now you've got to change everything, is that two years is if you haven't tried to occupy it or, or maintain it. We have buildings that are empty, that are, are vacant, but the owners are still maintaining them. The power is turned on, they're still visiting the building. I don't consider those as abandoned buildings because they're still being occupied throughout the day, whether they're trying to to reestablish a business or to try to get a rental and uh, a tenant in that space. That's kind of the purpose of what we, what we set forth with the 24 months. I think Jimmy did a pretty good job answering that, uh, but just to be clear, code enforcement is, is separate uh, from the intent of what he's separate talking about. Mind as he was talking. So yeah, it, this has to do with exactly what he said uh, in terms of it was a grocery store. It hasn't been a grocery store. It's been vacant for, for three years. And folks come in and say, I want to make it a, a grocery store. And it had been a grocery store for 50 years. But it doesn't have ADA bathrooms. It doesn't have uh, any type of fire alarms in it, et cetera. We constantly have the issue of saying, well, it used to be a grocery store, so it should be able to be a grocery store now. And we say, no, there are life safety codes that has to be brought up to. So we are being exceptionally lenient. That's why it's in the amendments as compared to what other cities do. Other cities utilize, not all of them, but they utilize their zoning codes or other things where it's 60 days or 90 days or 120 days uh, if, if a use ends, especially if it's a non-compliant use. We talked long and hard, and we went from six months to 12 months to 24 months, and I don't know if you'll find anybody that's that lenient in terms of uh, an extended period of non-use to still be compliant uh, and, and active. Yeah, and I apologize, because as I, as I was asking my question and as you were answering it, I was like, uh, I probably should have thought about my question a little bit harder because as soon as I see abandoned and vacant, the first thing I start thinking of is, you know, someone losing their property. So we give them the 24 months, but in that 24 months, are we willing to take into consideration market conditions? If, you know, sometimes you just, there's no activity. There's no one looking to purchase a building or open a business for whatever reason, your space isn't fitting their needs and it could take you longer than 24 months. Are we gonna make sure we're clear on what they need to do so that they don't become considered abandoned or vacant during that 24 months? I know we have like a gentleman who, you know, puts a sign up and he does things, you know, little things in his building so that he doesn't come that way. It, like if it's an existing 
or was a year ago a grocery store and they go out of business and they're not able to find someone to move in to that space and take over the grocery store but in three and a half years somebody comes back and says oh I'd love to open a grocery store well the 24 months period has come and gone but the market conditions didn't really they weren't conducive for somebody to come take that space there wasn't a demand for it. It could have been just because our population or whatever. You know, there's a reason why somebody's not coming. It's hard to tell them that we know you were trying to get someone to come. It just took you three years to get someone. So sorry, you're a year late. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I understand what you're referring to. What, what we were addressing on this was more of the buildings that have been neglected that have absentee owners uh, that just absolutely, they don't come down to visit the building. The building is setting disrepair. Um, we have started having roof concerns and now it starts to, the self demolition of itself. So that's what we're addressing. That was the purpose of it. Um, hoping that by having a definition that we can follow with a, a specific definition and a timeline, we have something to go back on and say, hey, we've established this because no, so many times we get the conversation of, well, it's only been empty for this for five years, you know, or why do I got to bring it up to the new codes? Well, if, without having something defined specifically in a timeline, we felt that the 24 hour, the 24 months was a, was a fair amount of time for it. Thank you. Um, well, and then also, didn't you say that as long as it's maintained, which anybody that owns commercial property, we're talking commercial here at the moment, but, uh, Anybody that owns commercial property, if they're wanting to flip it or sell it or lease it or whatever they want to do, most rational people would keep it up to snuff. They wouldn't let it sit there and just deteriorate and shut off all the utilities and just let it go to hell. Yes, sir. Well, that's, that's the way I understood yes, where you're coming from. So. The way I look at it, uh, market markets or no markets, uh, if you're going to own a commercial building, you've got to keep it up to code, no matter if you're occupying it or if you're running a business or not. That's just that's just keep blight down and public safety and everything. So I think 24 months, I think that's fine. I mean, so just to specify her question. If, if for me to understand, if a, a property owner who owns a commercial property has put their property in the market and it, it, uh, it was, has a certificate of occupancy as one direction, the market does not allow for sale for whatever reason. During that time, if that owner continues to come to the property and turn on the lights, do basic standard maintenance on their property, and they are able to sell their property after those two years, they should have no issues with that certificate of occupancy being reissued to the new owner under the same conditions, correct? Well, here, so you're, you're saying that if a, a person maintained the property for the, uh, for the two year period or over two years, Although they don't, it's not occupied. That's the They're that's the word I'm getting stuck right. on, is that the occupancy that there was nobody in it in the two years because somebody could say, well, no, it's been on the market for two and a half years, so therefore you haven't occupied it, and that's where I'm getting stuck. Is, is that I want to ensure that our business owners, when they sell their property, and although they are not occupying it, they're still maintaining it that that won't cause a hindrance post sale for the new owners. Well, there's two different issues there. Um, one has to do with the actual, actual occupancy. And, and what we're saying is if it was a market for the last 50 years, uh, and even if it's not a market, if it's less than 24 months, if somebody wanted to go in and put in a market there, that CFO would still be able to carry forward. Uh, however, if it was a market for 50 years and it sat vacant for three years and wanted to come in as a market, no matter what the market conditions are, our job is to protect life, safety, and public welfare. It's, it's just not good form for any government to say the codes 50 years ago are just good enough. Um, our intent is to continually improve these buildings and make sure that they're up to code. So if it's over two years and it sat vacant, when they come in to occupy that building as a market, they have to make sure that the life safety codes are met. 
So even if they turn on the water and they go in and walk around and make sure there's no mice eating. But that doesn't help with fire alarms and ADA access and, and exit requirements and, and those types of things that are there to protect the public safety. So yeah, I see what you're you saying. Would you mind if I read the, the, the definition of what we put in place? Uh, that way maybe it'll clarify a few things. Go ahead, Jimmy. So the, the, we, we put in two, two new definitions. One is abandoned and one being vacant. The abandoned building, abandoned definition would be a building that is no longer used or occupied by its owner for the legally permitted occupant. Evidence of building being abandoned includes any two of the following, lack of visibility, visible activity or use, overgrown or dead vegetation, accumulation of trash, junk, or debris, absence of furnishings, evidence of criminal mischief or criminal trespass, evidence of dilapidation, decay, damage, deterioration, non-payment or disconnection of utilities. And the other definition of vacant, meaning the building that is no longer used or occupied by its owner or other legally permitted occupant. What that means is that we take a building that was designated as a B building and there's somebody tries to move in and start selling a thrift store item such as a mercantile. Okay. That building was never listed as a M occupancy and there's certain restrictions that are required for that. So that was the, the difference between the two. We had to designate what are, we, what are we trying to achieve, where are we trying to go with this, was to, if the building has been occupied under as a B as a business and it's been a business, that's not the concern, it's, is the, if they've just left it alone, turned the utilities off, and it's, it's starting to fall down. Okay, so, I'm sorry, Kristen. Oh, that's, so, either we're not hearing each other, Okay. Or we're just really confused because what Brent said was that if it is vacant, because which, what yes. Kristen is saying, that is if the owner moves out, they maintain utilities, they maintain the property, they they've got the landscaper coming, they've got utilities on, they're coming to check the property regularly or they're, whoever it is watching the property for them to make sure that it doesn't get vandalized, that there's no water leaks, every, sure. you know, keep it still in sellable condition, that that at 24 months is now going to fall into that their certificate of occupancy would not extend to the new owner. We're not asking that if they change um, zoning, not if it's going from being a, a grocery store to a, a clinic or vice versa or anything. It's just if it was a grocery store two years ago, they've maintained the property. There's just no one actually in there operating a business because for whatever reason, they had to close their grocery store. And now a new person wants to come and open a grocery store in that business. It's had utilities to it for the last three years. They've maintained the landscaping. They've done everything. The only thing they haven't done is actually have customers come in and occupy the space. Under this, at 24 months, that cert it would, they would have to come in and completely update everything because it fell past the 24 months even though they still maintained everything but because there was no one physically in the building so I think we're getting confused on the part about occupying the building or the building being used for what it was classified for. So what we're saying with a grocery store, if a grocery store went out of business and it sat empty, meaning there was no, no active business in it, so it was not actively a grocery store for two years, when they come in to re reestablish a business, that would be the, 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 what the definition sp spells out, that it has not been actively being used for what it was designed for. That's kind of what it's saying. So, so I think we're hurting our business owners that by that because it, it is very difficult to sell commercial properties. Commercial properties can take a long time to sell in a hot market and a slow market because it has to be the perfect property for the new buyer. So when you take a, a building that was a grocery store and it's, it did, when I think of sit, I think of abandonment, like it sat. They didn't do anything they could care less about their building and now it looks like some of, you know, some of our historic buildings where nobody cared that owned it. 
So when you take an owner who they care enough to still keep utilities there, they still make sure that there's no fire hazards and they, they've done all that. And at the time they left that building, they met code and they're marketing that building as being zoned to be a, a grocery store space. And it takes them three years to find somebody in a completely other state or to work out a deal with CVS or whoever to come and take that space. If I'm buying it with the assumption because it was zoned this way that I'm going to be able to still fit within that zoning and because I'm not changing zoning, I still am under their original um, code enforcement and that everything at the time they owned it was to code. So when the new owner comes, not only now do they have to pay for the building, they now have to go in and renovate and do things to bring it up to code that they most likely were not aware of because they weren't changing zoning. You added a nuance in your definition there that I think is very important. You said a building that's unoccupied that was up to code when it was closed down. So that's a very different scenario than say the Smith building that was a grocery store for 50 years and sat vacant for, for 12 years. Right. It was not up to code. Um, in, in your instance, you're saying, for example, the family dollar sat there and sat vacant. After two years, it doesn't mean they have to redo everything. It means that our staff is gonna go out from a public safety perspective. They're gonna check the ingress, the egress. They're gonna check and see if it has a fire alarm. It will, in terms of the, the family dollar, there's probably not gonna be an issue. Where it becomes an issue is when, like the Smith Building, where um, it was built in the 1800s. Yeah, it was a grocery store for, for 80 years, uh, but it doesn't meet any modern codes. Uh, it would be irresponsible for us to say, well, it was a grocery store for 80 years. Um, we, sh we should grandfather it forever as a grocery store and allow it to be a grocery store because it was a grocery store for 80 years. Um, we would assume a lot of liability uh, in that in terms of uh, our code officials in the town of Florence not doing a good job to make sure that there is fire protection, there is entry and exit requirements that are met to make sure that people can get in and out of that building, uh, et cetera. So if it was a modern building, the chances are it's gonna be up to code or close to code and that would be established by our folks. If it's an old building, it's gonna be a challenge. Like I said, most cities would do it based on what's in the zoning ordinance, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days. Uh, we're giving folks 24 months. I would guess that that's probably the most, it's the most I've ever heard of, uh, but pro you reviewed codes from every major city in the Valley. Does anybody else give uh, a cushion like the one that we're providing? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't really care what the other, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be like that, but I, to me, that's great that we have a, a, a bigger time frame than other places. Hopefully that will have businesses come to us because they'll see we're more, that we're more open. But in that, if it is an old building, it met code requirements when it was given its certificate of occupancy. And so it doesn't have to be a new building, but at the time when they held their certificate of occupancy, they met the requirements to get that certificate of occupancy. So let's not, so if it's not a new building, it's one of our older buildings, but they've done, they've maintained the condition that they were required to maintain it in to keep their certificate of occupancy. They now have so, put their building up for sale. It takes them three years to sell it. That new owner will not fall under those codes. They will have to now go from I don't know, I'm throwing out numbers, so let's not hold on to those numbers, but 1996 or, you know, 19 whatever, and now all of a sudden we're at 2012. In my mind, that's a pretty big step, but they were at, they, they were able to have their certificate of occupancy while they owned that business because of whatever they needed to do to get that. But when the three year, when that 24 months hits, and somebody takes a little bit longer, it could be one day, it could be a month, or it could be a year longer, that new person no longer qualifies for that simply because it was a 24 month period. We're not talking about a building that's been sitting empty for 15 years and the roof is caving in and there's mold. 
we all get that. I mean, we know that just in renovation, they're gonna be over 50% and they're gonna to have to come up to code. I've got that. I've had enough conversations, I understand that part. I'm concerned about buildings that they don't meet the 2012 code because they're not required to at, at the time they were given their certificate of occupancy. And as long as they don't change things, they don't rip out bathrooms and move things around, they get to still be part of that original code that their certificate of occupancy was under. But the new owner would not be able to do that be, once that 24 months, if it was the same exact type of business? I think maybe there's the, and I'm gonna look at it from, it, to me, to, to make the new code, to comply with the new code, it's actually minimal because it would be like electrical issues. So I'll give you an example. If we have a building that's set empty, um, they've had electrical turned on. The, when they move into it, so we're gonna look at the life safety and look at the like Yes, a, a fire system at about right. $10,000. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I okay, just know this, but I'm just that's thinking, better. I mean, that, that's one of the first things that comes to my mind is just the, for fire and safety, we gotta make sure they're safe. Recently, there was a quote for one of my clients at about $10,000 for him to get everything done that was being asked. So then if you add everything else into that, okay. this, this could be become, this could price someone out of being able to come in and open that business. And that's my concern is, how do we make sure that we're still open for people to come in and help fill some of these empty buildings before they get to the point where it's been sitting there for 10 years and now every, we have more than just life, like we have bigger issues versus, you know what I'm saying? Like I just, I'm concerned that we're going to kick ourselves in the butt in the end of this because we've cut ourselves too short and we didn't leave ourselves open to give some leeway simply because a 24 month timestamp came and there was no one actively in the building. The one way to look at this is um, our existing codes actually more restrictive than this. So if we don't approve the 2012 codes, our existing codes are more restrictive than what we're proposing. Uh, and we have to have codes. Uh, so it, it's, it comes down to life safety, protecting life safety and, and our job as, as, as government we're trying to be less restrictive, more lenient, and allow more flexibility than even the codes that we currently have. The other thing is the 2012 codes are more lenient towards historic buildings uh, than the 2006 codes. So there are a lot of benefits uh, of going to the, to the 2012 codes and, and we were very mindful to try and be less restrictive. And, and trust me, we had six months and uh, we went round and round and round about what it could be. We looked at history of projects, we looked at individual buildings in the downtown, success stories and, and stories that, that weren't successes and uh, put a lot of, uh, like I say, uh, thought into to the 24 months. So if you choose not to uh, adopt the 2012 codes, the 2006 codes are actually more restrictive uh, as approved by the town and in the town code now. Uh, question, question about that. Uh, I understand the state has also adopted these codes. So if they've adopted the 2012 code already. They actually are on 2015 right now and they're gonna go to 2018 in the next year but the state is on the 2015 codes. Well, doesn't that Yes. Require us to be on those codes to do? Uh, uh, no, uh, not. It's, it's up to every individual jurisdiction. Here is the caveat to that. The caveat to that has to do with the fire code uh, in terms of buildings where the state is the authority. So schools and, and things like that, they have to be up to the state adopted code, specifically from the fire perspective, uh, which is 2015 and will soon be 2018 but we don't inspect those buildings. We're not responsible for those buildings. They're handled by the state fire marshal. Um, all of the other um, enforcement that's done is done based on our code and, and our adopted codes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Council Member Larson. I'm, I'm trying to choose my words. So um, I just get frustrated because I look at, say, that at green building, and I apologize, I'm not really good with the names of buildings, but the, the green building over there, it's very beautiful. The owners have done a great job of next to the, the 
yeah. that is, um, and it's currently for sale. It's got the little house in the back. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Um, and for somebody who's obviously upkeeping their property. Activity. Total Concepts, the hair salon. No. no. She's talking about the one across the, the county owns the lot next to it. I believe it's called the Rap Saloon. Oh, okay. I was on a different area. Neither here nor there. My point is, is that I think we all understand the negligent owners. I still really struggle because of the fact that they sell that house at two years and one day. Now this person who's bought it said, wow, I don't know if they have a CFO. I'm just making assumptions here. They have a CFO. Oh, I'm going to go buy this property. I'm going to open my store. I've, I've, it's already beautiful. I don't have to do many renovations. I am ready. And maybe they have a little nest egg of five or $10,000 to do their minor updates, maybe decorations, whatever it might be. Um, and then they decide, okay, I'm going to go ahead and open my shop. And they go to do that. And they're like, oh, it's been two years. Now I have to go get a new CFO. Well, now you have to get up to date to code. And now it doesn't meet. And now they have to get their fire suppression system. And now that gleeful owner who has good intention and for the property that's been maintained during its sale process now has no money, no nest egg to be able to do those things. So although they may now, they might have been a thriving business on Main Street at that point. Now we've detoured that business to be not even able to open that door and we've got yet another vacant build building on Main Street that's not able to be financially upkept. So I still struggle with this one. So uh, please, I beg of you to find another way to, to divert me, to show me that this would be possible in that situation. Because to me, I can't look at the, the deteriorating buildings on Main Street and say, well, it's the individual owner's fault. They should have known better when there are people who do want better for Main Street and they do have the best of intentions. Maybe they have had a history of a building being upkept and it's, we're gonna detour that entire great streak that they've had and make them turn a different direction because of the simple 24 month period um, and I just, that really still bothers me. So I appreciate that you, what you're saying, Brent, and it's just. Well, here's a simple question. What, I mean, that building hasn't had a CFO in years, hasn't had a commercial occupant. Would you propose that anybody that wants to go in that building shouldn't have to bring that building up to code because they repainted it last year? That's not the point of whether that specific building has a CFO. I'm thinking of that one because it's very beautiful and, I, and I'm assuming that during the sale process that owner, as they've presented, appears to be upkeeping the property. So I was trying to give you an example of a positive experience that has been brought through up to that point and that per this code wouldn't matter that all the CFO that's been there, that no matter how much they come in and turn the lights on, turn the water on, scrub everything, maintain everything, that none of that, all of that goes out the window at 24 months. And that new owner is now stuck detouring because of a simple 24 month period. So to me, the difference between it being abandoned and vacant I, I get that. Those 100%, I think all of us understand if that building is being abandoned or vacant, that's, that's understandable. But when you have maintenance and you have it, the occupancy is where I get stuck, that word occupancy. Um, but that, that building hasn't been occupied in 10, maybe more years. So it's, it's, it's not a good example. Okay, I'm not gonna win with you, so I- I'm, I'm just trying to, trying to make sense of it. I, uh, well, I'm not looking- I'm, Oh, I'm sorry, Bill, go ahead. I'm, I'm not looking for any examples here, all I'm, I agree to the point that, you know, if we're really serious about bringing Main Street back alive, anybody that's willing to maintain their building, I don't care if they keep it closed five years before they sell it. If it was up to code when they closed it and they've maintained it, they've kept the electricity on, the utilities, they've kept it clean, there's no leaking roofs. I don't, I don't agree with us making them go in there and, and remodel it and bring it up to uh, whatever standards were at at that time. I think, you know, like the old uh, oak room down there, that has not been maintained. It has been abandoned for 25 years or 30 years. That 
is, yes, that needs to have work done. But just because somebody closes a business down here and uh, puts it on the market and it sits there for three or four or five years, as long as they're maintaining it, as long as they're keeping it clean, uh, it's not blight, it's not a safety hazard, they keep the utilities on, I, as far as I'm concerned, that, that should sound or be the same as occupancy. Can I ask the council a question, sir? Sure. Go ahead, I have a question. Jimmy. Absolutely. I, I want to I want to present an instance. If we have a building that's a grocery store and it was established in 1979 as a grocery store, and it it went out of business, it's been a, vacant for two years. Okay. We have a new grocery store comes in or another occupancy that is the same type of occupancy, so it meets their criteria, such as a B business occupancy it never changes but yet the use changes in it now it requires more bathrooms because of the new code it requires an ada bath because it's public it's a public facility so at what point we need to have a date established that this building no longer meets the current code we need to upgrade that building to meet the current code for the current business the ADA, I'll agree with you, that is a federal deal. We have yes, no bearing on that. My understanding, the way the law reads, is, is once a building is sold, resold, if it wasn't up to ADA before, under the previous code, once a building is sold by federal law, it has to be brought up to ADA standards once it changes hands. Now, maybe I'm wrong on that. Maybe I can get a uh, I can't confirm on, this, on the sale portion, but, what I can but say. I, well, I'm, that's what we go by yes, here, yes. is if you sell a, a, a business and you were grandfathered under the old ADA, you're still okay. Once you sell the building, then it has to be brought up to ADA compliance. Now that's everything I've read and it, heard it, about. So. Council member, it, it doesn't have to do with sale. It has to do with, with improvements. And we follow uh, under the same law from a town perspective. So for example, if we have a street that has non-compliant ADA ramps, we don't have to replace those ADA ramps until we actually go in and improve the street. And then we have to improve the sidewalks, then we have to improve the ADA ramps. So for a commercial building, it's, it's similar. It, it doesn't trigger with the sale, it triggers with uh, when they do improvements to, to have to bring it up. No, 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 no. I'm, on I'm ADA not, only. I'll argue with you on that. They, no, no. A while back, we, we had, I can't remember what the issue, one of these buildings, uh, it was brought up that it wasn't, um, the entrances or whatever exits weren't ADA, the ramps weren't just right or something. And they said, well, no, it's because uh, it's, it was that, it, in other words, it's under, if, under the old ADA rules. So they didn't, they didn't have to bring it up to the newest rules unless, and I was told, and this is by staff, unless it changes hands, unless it changes ownership. Now, uh, Mayor, I, uh, may I ask, since there's so much discussion, would it be possible that we make a motion to table this and go to E-session, not tonight, or make another You e mean work session? Work session, sorry, not E-session. Okay. A work session for this, because I think we have a lot of things to discuss. Absolutely. I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Um, let's set a work session for as early as next Monday. We'll coordinate our schedules with staff and get that on a calendar. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. I appreciate everybody's feedback into this. One of the questions I look forward to just asking is, you had mentioned the difference between 2006, 2012. I just would love to see the points of how it's easier. 
I sent it, uh, I sent all that out to council last year and probably January or February. So, and Lisa included uh, it in the packet as well. It's in there, but it would be helpful just to communicate it okay. at the meeting for public. All right, now the next item also, um, yeah, all three items will be tabled just so this way we'll have the work session. We don't want to, you know, take up valuable staff time and. Does the appeal board, are we, we going to vote on that or move that forward? You have to vote on the tabling. You want to table that one too? Okay, I need a motion to, let's go in order. So we tabled item D. Item E is ordinance number 674-19. That would be the first reading of an ordinance of the town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, adopting the following publications with appendices and the town of Florence amendments listed herein are adopted by reference, regulating and governing the conditions by maintenance of all property, buildings, and structures by providing the standards for supplied utilities and facilities and other physical things and conditions essentially to ensure that structures are safe, sanitary, and fit for occupation and use and condemnation of buildings and structures unfit for human occupancy and use of demolition of such structures in the town of Florence, Arizona, providing for the issuance of permits and collection of fees, therefore repealing section 15, 150, 300 of the town of Florence code of ordinances and all other ordinances or parts of law in conflict with their with. So I need a motion to table that one as well, pending a work session. I make such a motion. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And item F, which would be ordinance number 675-19, which would be the first reading of an ordinance of the town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, amending the town of Florence code of ordinances by modifying 150.301 titled Board of Appeals by inserting new text as underlined and deleting text by strike through. I need a motion to table that as well pending the work session. I make a motion that we table item 13F. Second. And a second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. And it looks like the next one as well, and then we can move on to item H. Ordinance number 673-19, first reading of an ordinance of the town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, amending the Code of Ordinance, Arizona, Title 11 business regulations by adopting new Chapter 111 relating to the regulation of mobile food. No, we can do this one. Yeah. Mobile food units, establishing a purpose setting forth definitions, providing for permit requirements, establishing occupational requirements, setting forth violations, establishing penalties, and setting forth an effective date. I'm excited about this food truck ordinance. We are going to bring food trucks to Arizona and Florence. All right, let's talk about this one. Ms. Lisa Garcia. Mayor, members of council, as you'll recall in 2018, during the legislative session, House Bill number B2371 established a statewide food truck and a health, savings, health safety licensing standards for all mobile food and operation vendors. This is actually the ordinance that was written by the League of Arizona Cities and Towns. It's called a Model City Code, and that is when they send them out to all municipalities. It allows for all municipalities to have the same, same rules so that food trucks can operate effectively and efficiency, efficiently within the municipal boundaries. The way that it was established is that every every city prior to this had their own rules so that a municipal a food truck had to go into the municipality and establish how they were going to be inspected, understand the regulations of what the food truck is. So this is just a model city tax code that will go in place and um, be just for consistency without throughout the state. Um, this is just a first reading only. We'll bring it back for the second reading. We're still working on the map. We'll bring it out the next meeting. The, the Model City Tax Code does state that you cannot have a food truck within 250 feet 
of a residential zone. That's to make sure that food trucks besides ice cream trucks are exempt, but other food trucks don't go into the R1 zone or residential housing. And so we do have a map that will show where food trucks are able to serve. We're still working on that to get out a few of the other little nicks. We do have food truck Thursdays at the Windmill Winery. We want to make sure that they're still able to. When the town of Florence does special events, we have food trucks on Main Street, and the county does have food trucks, and, and the state prison does allow food trucks. So we want to make sure that Anthem can also have food trucks in their parks and that anybody who wants to do a special event can bring in and we can have a location for them to have a special event in their area and have the food trucks and still meet the model city ordinance. All right. And again, this was a first reading only. Yes, ma'am. Any questions, comments, concerns? Does this include schools? Um, the schools, the schools are, would be separate because they would be 250 feet from residential. So I, on the map I will show you, on the 6th, you will see that the parking lot for the high school is carved out. I, I do not, I have to go back in and look at the elementary schools. Okay. If elementary schools were doing a special event license, they could have a food truck. Right. I, have, I have one question. This is kind of a silly question, but why are ice cream trucks exempted? Is it so they can drive through the neighborhoods? Yes, and it's, it's specified specifically it? within the code that ice cream trucks are still allowed. Okay, okay. Yes. Just wondering. The, oh, I'm sorry, I just thought of something. Does that include like little push carts or uh, like the hot dog guy that isn't when you think of food truck, you think of a truck. Yeah. Like, uh, it would know. include anything that would be considered a mobile food okay. vendor. All right. Item H, discussion, approval, disapproval of the professional services agreement with Plan ET Communities LLC to update the Town of Florence redevelopment plan, update 2019 in an amount not to exceed $113,115. Mr. Larry Harmer. Good evening, Mayor Council. Um, understanding that it's very, very uneventful evening so far, I'll see if I can add to that. Um, this is a, uh, a, a project that, quite frankly, came unexpected to us. Um, the state legislature, uh, this last session, last year, um, adopted changes to the um, redevelopment section of the uh, Arizona Revised Statute. So this is to put it to get us up into compliance for that. The current plan we have was adopted in 2009. Um, the new statute says that the, the cities and towns that have a redevelopment plan have to update it every 10 years. Uh, if not, it becomes null and void after a, a certain grace period thereafter. Um, this is also a, a, a project, though, that we are going to be tying very closely to the general plan update, which we plan on hitting the streets with an RFQ here in the next 30 to 60 days to get that one moving forward. Uh, as established in our current budget year. The, um, there are a couple what I consider flaws in the existing plan that we want to rectify, and that was very specifically brought out in the mandatory um, meeting we had prior to the submittals. One of them is, if you've looked at our redevelopment plan, it is thick. There's a lot of volume to it, a lot of fluff, quite frankly. It doesn't get into the real nitty gritty of what is required for a redevelopment plan for its implementation. And that's one of the things that we were very specific in our uh, quest this time was to make sure that we ended up with a very succinct, to the point, implementable document. Um, the uh, uh, data has to be updated. Everything in it is at least 10 years old as far as statistical data, population data, uh, a number of other areas. Uh, that you know are going to be needed to be updated. Um, we requested in our RFQ, and that's a request for qualifications rather than a request for proposals. That way, we were able to select who what we felt uh, were the best overall team, and then negotiated a scope of work and in, in the contract amount to follow. Um, the successful team, Planet. Um, has a group of professionals that are versed in redevelopment plans. They have all participated together as a team previously in other communities. Uh, it does bring together planning, uh, legal review, traffic and engineering, 
historic preservation and uh, an economist uh, to, to meet the requirements of the statute for redevelopment plan products, all of those expertises are really required in order to put together a compliant document. Um, also, you know, why even have one? We are, you know, having an area already specified, it does help us, uh, help the community in acquisition and disposition of uh, properties, helps the town in, uh, to do that, as was even mentioned in the uh, Quinn building action earlier. Uh, it supports the use of the government property uh, lease excise tax, the giplet. Uh, it does allow you to use that uh, particular financial incentive. It also helps support CDBG projects in the declaration of slum and blight within a redevelopment area. Um, the focus of our redevelopment plan is primarily commercial properties up and down the Main Street uh, corridor, uh, starting about First Street and going all the way south uh, to the 287 lo or link. Um, and uh, we, you know, we recommend just staying within the limits that we currently have for a number of reasons. The biggest one is trying to expand or, or do anything to make our redevelopment area larger gets into a whole discussion of slum and bright, blight on additional properties that have not been included. And that get, becomes very controversial with property owners. So since we have a designated area, we will reaffirm that and move forward with that same uh, outline. The two appointed uh, commissions, the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Historic District Advisory Commission will both be involved in this process since the, a lot of the Historic District is included and of course the Planning Commission as it relates to land use planning and, and uh, uh, projections for the area. Um, the biggest thing that we really want to accomplish with this though, the, the current plan has a lot of stated goals, goals and objectives throughout, but the actual implementation strategies are lacking. And that's the part that we really want to focus on is to actually pull together meaningful implementation strategies that a private developer or the town can use to move forward with projects themselves to help facilitate that process. Um, also, uh, as I said, we'll be bringing, this is one of the elements that'll be tied to the general plan update along with other projects that are already in the works. Uh, the, the regional transportation study, the parks master plan, the active, transpor or active transportation plan that are already currently underway. This will be another element that we can tie directly into the general plan update uh, and, and so that we don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel for those particular elements within the general plan. Um, and then with us tonight, we've, um, and you know, poor gal, she had to sit here through all of this. We invited the lead uh, principal of uh, Planet here, Leslie Dornfeld, in case you had any particular questions of her. So she's sitting in our audience tonight. Any questions? Well, I, on page eight, 4.8, prohibited boycott. Explain that to me, I don't, I don't get it. Uh, says we can't agrees for the duration of this contract to not engage in a boycott of Israel. What does Israel have to do with this? Mayor, members of the council, Councilman Hawkins, that's, that's a standard. When in Arizona, a municipality hires for service, uh, there's, that's a statutory requirement, believe it or not, uh, that we add that into our contract. So um, that's from the state legislature. That's pretty bizarre, but our legislature is bizarre at certain times. Uh, I've got a question about the financial impact. That's close to $900,000. For? If I read that right. No. No, the, the, if, I, if you like, I'll go over that real briefly. Um, this fiscal year, uh, there's been an allocation of 350,000 and next fiscal year, 300,000 to handle the Parks and Rec Comprehensive Plan uh, and site, certain site-specific plans, the general plan. This was the new element that I just mentioned. This was kind of thrown into the mix by the legislature last time. So that would be included in that overall $650,000. But the, the 241 has already been subtracted out of that for the Parks Master Plan. And so we're not, uh, the total amount we were working with to begin with for the two fiscal years was 650. Okay. So it's been reduced by 241. This will reduce it by another 113. So it'll leave us a little under, I think it was like 294,000 
to do the general plan with, which uh, based on the way we're packaging the RFQ, I anticipate coming in a bit less than that. Okay. Madam you. Mayor, Council Member, um, three years ago we set forth on this state required path to update our general plan and that general plan has multiple components. Um, we've been very lucky in that from the transportation standpoint, we were able to get a grant to help us with our regional transportation plan as well as we were able to get a grant to help us with uh, our active transportation plan. I'm looking right. at Brian, uh, which is the bicycle and the pedestrian component. And so uh, um, of the amount, uh, amount of money that was originally allocated, I believe to do five different studies, we're getting help on two of those. We did not ever plan to have to update the redevelopment plan as, as part of the general plan update, but the legislature determined that we had to. <laughs> Uh, so we're, we're squeezing it into the amount for all the other studies and we were able to do that because of the grants we received. Thank you. Is there any further questions or comments regarding a, this agenda item? With that, I need a motion. I make a motion to approve the professional services agreement with Planet Communities LLC to update the Town of Florence redevelopment plan update 2019 in an amount not to exceed $113,115. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And thank you for being here tonight, ma'am. All right, Mr. Ben Bitter with our legislative update. Dun, dun. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, we're still in the midst of the budget at the, at the uh, Capitol, and so not a lot of progress on bills, but uh, there is some important progress, particularly as it relates to cities and towns in terms of the budget. Um, if you remember, in April of last year, the Supreme Court of the United States heard the case Wayfair versus South Dakota ultimately ruled that states and by extension cities and towns uh, for as much as it relates to us are able to tax uh, transactions that occur even outside of the state if there is a tie back to the, uh, the state of, in this case, Arizona. Um, that has been an ongoing discussion in Arizona since that case was ruled in terms of how Arizona is going to capture that tax revenue that had not been coming into the state. They had anticipated doing that through the budget, uh, but there have been unexpected challenges that we've seen in the past few weeks, and particularly even today has been a large challenge to uh, the discussion. Because Arizona uses the model city tax code and has, as a part of the model city tax code, a retail component which allows each city and town to decide for themselves what will be taxed and how much it will be taxed, how it will be taxed. That's all done outside of the legislative purview, which means we all as cities and towns have local control of that. The proposal that is now before the legislature is to remove that retail component from the model city tax code and put it in statute. That would effectively mean that the state would have authority over our local, um, local ability to charge tax rates on sales of retail sales. That is a serious red line that we will not cross, and certainly something that we are concerned about could have a financial impact of about $469,000 for us each year. Mm -hmm. um, so we are actively working with our legislators. Please, if you see them, make sure that they're aware that we want to have that economic nexus in the model city tax code, that the model city tax code should remain how it's always been outside of the legislature handled by a professional body of, of tax representatives. And we wanna make sure that that is, is uh, handled how it's been and make sure that the state is able to get the revenue that it's due. And so that's our, our message right now is, is we're pushing for Wayfair to be um, settled properly, how it's been done in 45 other states up to this point and make sure that we're not going to see negative impacts as opposed to the positive impacts we had anticipated as part of the Supreme Court decision. What bill was that? There's not a bill for it, Councilmember Anderson. It's just part of the budget package. Uh, we anticipate there will be a bill for it in the coming days or weeks, but right now it's just the talking point that we need to make sure that the model city tax code is protected and remains outside of statute. 
And there was an email that was sent out today too. If council didn't receive that, I'll make sure that you guys receive that all as well. Okay, it came from the state. Yeah. League of Cities. Mm -hmm. That's it, yeah. yeah. We're happy to answer any other questions. No, well, thank you. All right, manager's report. Mayor, members of council, I have two items tonight. Hopefully you had a chance on your way in uh, to see David Jacobelli and uh, check out the new AMR ambulances uh, that were out front. Uh, we were particularly excited when we found out that they were gonna rebrand and, and put Florence on the side of, of their new units, which they did. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to bring folks' attention to is the fact that these units are not like other units that, that AMR has used here in the past. They have dual air conditioning. They have air conditioning in the front and air conditioning in the back uh, with, with a separate coil, uh, et cetera. And we hope that that provides a whole new level of service to, to our folks that, that we haven't had in the past. Secondarily, if James would like to come forward, uh, I'm very happy to report uh, that when Mr. Allen was hired by the town, uh, we provided him some very specific uh, goals for him, him to meet and, and gave him a time period to do that. And I'm happy to report that he has uh, met those goals in that he's added to his repertoire of certifications, building code specialist, and more importantly, building code official in the state of Arizona. So I, I wanted to announce that to the council and take this chance to congratulate him on his accomplishment. That's all I have. Congratulations. First Sec ever certified building official in the town of Florence. That's excellent. All right, call to the public. Second call to the public. And closed. Call to the council. Current events only. Council Member Hawkins. Well, Country Thunder lucked out on their weather other than last Wednesday when it was real Wednesday, but that really didn't start till Thursday. But And also on our road to Country Thunder the week before, we uh, experienced great weather once again and, and had a heck of a crowd. They estimated over 3,000 people, and there were a lot of people, so, and everybody seemed to have a good time. It was good turnout. That's all I have. Excellent. Council Member Wall. I don't want to take up a lot of time, but I just want to acknowledge that I attended the award ceremony for National Library Week bookmark contest at the community center. Uh, there were over 800 bookmarks uh, submitted by K through 12 students in Florence Unified. Uh, they had them all hanging on uh, wires on the the walls of the community center. It was really impressive to see what these kids have done. Uh, and there were awards given for every grade level and uh, one overall award as well. There were lots of parents and happy children there. It, it was really a, a heartwarming event and um, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Council Member Hughes. Friday I went to Pinnell Partnership and the topic was a panel on opportunity zones in Pinnell. And we had three economic development specialists from the county, Eloy and Casa Grande. We had the town manager from Superior. We had a um, opportunity zone fund a founder. And we also had a um, what else did we have? We had more. Oh, we had an attorney. What? You can never go anywhere without an attorney. So, but uh, what what they ended up doing is that they have because they're still trying to maneuver what the details of the opportunity zone. One of the things that I that was interesting to me was that the the fund gentleman said that they have sustainability. Um, rating system that was out and um, I went to Jennifer this morning and we we worked with the federal um, the Federal Reserve Bank they have uh, ratings and 
Casa Grande rates highest, 10 out of 10. Um, and then, unfortunately, this is where at least we have nowhere but up to go. We are rated one right now. And so, um, Superior and, and, and us are, are one because of some of the challenges that we have. But we have almost 20, we have over 2,100 acres. That includes, that also includes um, private residential areas. But it includes all of the territorial square, the downtown area. Um, so I think that we, I think that we have opportunities. And I'm excited to work with the community, work with the uh, investors, and see how we can position ourselves to move up the chain. And also then tomorrow evening, um, I'll be attending the Nicola uh, unveiling event with the mayor and the vice mayor. And they're going to, um, they'll have the technology and then they'll have demonstrations the next day. It's, they're going to have do a live stream online at the NicolaMotors.com. So anybody that there's going to be over 4,000 people there tomorrow night. Congratulations, Coolidge. Councilmember Larson. I don't have anything tonight. Councilmember Cortez. I had a lot of fun at Road to Country Thunder. I'm not uh, brave enough to attend Country Thunder. That's been a little out of my uh, crazy zone, so I couldn't do that. But I did have a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say I appreciate staff and everyone taking their time and listening to us and bearing with us and working through things. And don't get frustrated. It doesn't mean that you didn't do a good job. It just means that maybe we don't get it and we just need more clarification. So. I know that comments have been made that sometimes staff thinks that because we have a lot of com questions or because we table something that it's because they did a bad job. You probably did an excellent job. I'm just struggling with some of it or struggling to understanding and I just need to get more clarification for myself and for the public. So I don't want anybody to think you did a bad job because I don't think you guys do. And I wanted to congratulate you on your new um, certificate. Vice Mayor Anderson. Well, I can tell you my story about Country Thunder. My wife went to Safeway Saturday. She couldn't get through one aisle. Guess which aisle that was? <laughs> no, no. The vegetable aisle. Yeah, 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 the vegetable aisle. But the, anyway, uh, it, it seems that it had a very positive effect on Safeway. and. Uh, but the other thing that I did, did want to mention tonight is sort of a sad thing that we had on the news today uh, with the uh, fire in Paris and Notre Dame. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to take a tour of that several years ago. And when you look at it and think that, that was built in, in 1100, uh, it's, it's a beautiful building. It's, you know, you just can't say enough about it. Uh, you know, we went through our tragedies here several years ago in the 9-11. In the this is uh, the same kind of impact that they're looking over there, even though they don't have the terrorists. But they've lost uh, quite a bit in that building. So just keep that in mind. Thank you. All right, I'm going to be super short and Sweet. I want to thank everybody. You guys did a great job tonight on the agenda. We had a packed agenda. We have a lot to be proud of in our town. We're making a lot of positive progress moving forward. Country Thunder, I just want to say, Chief Hughes, your officers did a fabulous job on the street. I'll share later. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> they did. It was very safe, very secure. They made sure that everybody stayed where they were supposed to. And, um, that being said, we did present Country Thunder with a key to the town for all that they contribute. We do appreciate the partnership that they provide for us. Last year they did have the Country 
Artist of the Year, the Country Artist of the Decade, and they were the Country Music Festival across the nation. So that was pretty big. So a lot of people are looking at Florence for that. Um, Chief, your fire department, you guys did an amazing job as well. You know, they taking care of the town and keeping them safe. This has been a super long meeting, so I apologize. We are going into executive session. So with that, we need a motion and we'll probably adjourn in about two hours. Make a motion to adjourn to executive session. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.